McCarthy. Take the handoff. And Alec Mannis is going to throw a pick. Got back. Core up. Touchdown, Wolverine. Roman Wilson does it again. Four points of daylight. He got to the team at the blocker. Outside. Turns the corner. Play Core down the sideline. Looking over the middle. Caught. Touchdown, Wolverine. McCarthy extends the play. Now he needs a play. Yeah, here we are. After some brief technical difficulties, we are back under control. Tonight, did Tony Alford's Michigan, Michigan's new Tony Alford's, did Tony Alford, (laughs) Tony Alford's, those are, I think those are shoes, possibly nice pants. Are we under control? No. (laughs) No. Did Tony Alford, Michigan's new running backs coach, really call Ohio State soft, or was he just impressed at Michigan's toughness? We're going to take a look at that, what he said, mm. and try to put Ohio State in the worst possible light we can. We've got a story on Tim Drevno, an old buddy of Jim Harbaugh, who is now working for said Ohio State. Traitor. 2024 spring power rankings, the way too early spring power rankings for Big Ten football. Viewer comments and the community poll all on the way tonight. Welcome to the Big Ten Team Rivalry Show. We're not uh, professionals. We're not insiders. We're just a couple of guys who like to talk football. We're big-time fans of Michigan football. We're here to uh, offer our opinions on what's going on, and we invite you to share your opinion with us, and we'll get talking about stuff and see where we get. We like to rep our teams. We're going to ask you to rep yours. You know, throw that in the chat. Who's your favorite team? Let us know. What's the battle cry? Buckeyes battle cry. I see you out there. Antoine's online too. Came on here early. Good to see you guys. I am your host, Cliff. I am a professional web developer and part-time amateur woodworker. Not even really part-time, just amateur. I'm just amateur. With me, as always, is my firstborn son, Mackenzie. Mac, how are you doing over there? I'm good. I'm pretty good. <laughs> I just, I noticed, I noticed something. I noticed something. Okay, and what? I need to, I need to talk about that. All right. Um, Hammer still hasn't come down. I've got mine. I'll bring my hammer down. I'll smash something. <laughs> Max smash. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. Do I have to give my profession? I work in marketing. I manipulate people into buying stuff they don't need. Boom. There you go. That's my day job. That's a, that's a tagline if ever there was a tagline. Yep. We are on the road to 1,000 subs. Currently at the start of this show, we are at 769 subs. Thank you, everybody out there, for subbing and watching. Really appreciate it. I love to have you guys here. Thank you for joining the Big Ten Team Rivalry Movement. I don't know what it is exactly or where it's going. but we activists all of a sudden? Maybe. Football activists. We need more football. We need more football. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That is a cause I can get behind. We need yeah. more football. I mean, why not? I don't know. So if you I haven't didn't... subscribed already, what are you waiting for? It's free. It's a good deal. We entertain you. You get to laugh at us. It's what What better opportunities do you have in life? Is this actually that entertaining? I think it's very entertaining. I think it's fun to be on this side of the camera, and maybe it's really cringy to be on the other side. I don't know. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> we have... Uh, some a big announcement that we would like to make we're we're not going to make tonight uh we're we're on a bit of a delay as far as being able to announce something that's happening we are making connections um with another with a network not another network we're not a network they're a network but i don't want to tell you who it is because we haven't like you know finalized what's going on yet it's not like a big money contract it's just a thing uh but we don't want to get ahead of ourselves and before anyone freaks out it's not espn I know that seemed like the most likely choice, but, and actually, now that I remember, ESPN did approach us asking if we'd like to sign a contract with them, and we said no, because we have principles. You told me we were signing that contract. What happened? No. Oh. No. I got a call back on that boat I ordered. Do you live near a body of water? Several. Thank you. (laughs) all right sorry guys look everybody's out there doing stuff okay you guys are already talking about uh the ohio state spring game oh did i forget to announce uh 
yeah, next Saturday, uh, just as a heads up, so next Saturday we are going to live stream the uh, Michigan spring game, um, which is on at noon on Fox. Mm-hmm. And like we do with most bowl games and that, we'll, uh, uh, the, well, the, the bowl game and the, um, what was that last thing we live streamed? Oh, the, was the, the bowl game. Oh, the, bowl. the senior bowl. The senior bowl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we basically just, you know, we hop online and see how long we can, we can take. Um, spring games are just weird. That's, that's why I say that. I don't know how exciting a spring game could ever be, but well, well, we're going to live stream it. Um, so we will put out the, the notification on all that. So make sure you have notifications pushed and we will let you know what's going to happen there. Uh, mm-hmm. otherwise we will be here next Sunday night also. So two, two live streams for the price of none next week. That's true. Cause this is free this and is free. you can tell it's not BOGO. It's OGO. One get one. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. We should probably talk some football before people start. First, we got a us. community poll. <laughs> and uh, there's my new graphic there. Again, if there's any graphic artists out there, we need help. But this is what I came up with using the AI, which I thought was kind of cool. It is pretty cool. I like it. <laughs> I like it. The first poll Mac put out this week has to do with uh, Big Ten win totals. I think we were going to put out more of these. I uh, will probably put out a couple more this week, you think? I guess. I guess. I right. like it. Maybe. At any rate, we started with Ohio State. Mac is putting their win totals at 10 and a half. I said, what are you I taking? No, I didn't put that. That was FanDuel. That was not me. Do not blame me for that. Oh, oh I thought that was you. All right. So FanDuel is oh. doing this. All right. Well, FanDuel was- says 10 and a half wins. And 58% of 86 votes were taking the under on that. Ooh, that's <laughs> intense. It's almost like our audience is predominantly Michigan fans. Seems like it, although uh, we got Buckeyes Battle Cry and Rod Farva talking here. Yeah, we got our two uh, token Buckeye fans. Yep. Appreciate you guys. Oh, We're all about diversity on this channel. All about it, yeah. <laughs> The comment we got on the Ohio State uh, poll there was they will make the playoffs, then choke in the first round and get bounced. Book it. I, you think that'll be the case? No. No? Not in the first round. They'll they'll make it. I mean, because it's not that hard to make it. You just got to get in the top 12. Everyone's going to make it. Michigan's probably going to make it. But Ohio State's really good, especially on defense. Right. And if they have a an offense that is – all they need is a serviceable offense, and that's what they're going to at least get with Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly's a great OC. Right. So they're not going to get bounced in the first round, maybe the second or third, but not the first. Not the first, yeah. Well, There's I guess be... depending on who they play. But well, what, what have we got now? We're, we're still going to have the Big Ten Championship game, right? Yeah. So we got Big Ten Championship, then we got first round of the playoffs, quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals. Championship. Final, yeah. or first round, quarterfinals, semifinals, and finals. So five, basically five weeks of playoffs. That's Except true. that the, yeah. the first week is the uh, conference championships. But yeah, I, I don't see Ohio State uh, dropping out after the first round. I no, I just don't. No, their defense is going to be way too good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, poll number two. UCLA win total is five and a half. So this is coming from, you said FanDuel? Yeah. Yeah, this this hurts. So uh, what's his name? Deshaun Foster? Deshaun Foster, yeah. Deshaun Foster is the new head coach, brand new head coach, first time head coach to a team that is already hurting. And let's see, 76% of 59 votes took the under. Man, we got some cynical, uh, cynical, cynical voters fans. out there. Yeah, I mean... I said three and nine on our last live stream as their floor. Yeah. So yeah, I mean five and a half, five and a half feels high to me. I mean, they're they they had a lot of roster turnover, and obviously it's a completely new coaching staff. And honestly, Chip Kelly didn't exactly leave that program in the best place anyway. And I get like so I guess that that's kind of a knock on Chip Kelly, but the guy's obviously not a head coach. So he's mm-hmm. definitely where he should be at Ohio state as the OC. But if he's not a head coach, then that's fine. That's just how that works out. But that still means that UCLA is not in a good spot and they're not coming into the 24 season 
looking too hot. So, yeah, I would be shocked if they won more than five games. And you're not the only one, because the comment we got on this was from Ken Weasel, <laughs> who said, oh, and 12. <laughs> that hurts. Yeah. Heads will roll if that's if that's a thing. Yeah, that's that's going to be pretty bad. Yeah. All right, let's let's jump over to the chat here. What what uh, what are people saying over there? I haven't been able to keep up. Well, a couple of people got into a hissy fit over Ohio State. Uh, something else. Something, something else. else. <laughs> oh wait a minute, I've got okay. Here we go. I'm looking at the wrong chat again. So we've got okay. So I, I'm gonna step back a little bit here, Antoine. Antoine says, oh, Ohio State, I see a weaker offensive line, a weaker defensive line. The linebackers are not feeling the right gaps, and the quarterback is two steps back from Hunt. Oh, Cal McCord. <laughs> Good guess. <laughs> Ouch. Do they get good guess mileage? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, all right. Mm-hmm. I did see uh, an interview with Cal McCord on the um, Syracuse. Oh, what is it called? Syracuse has a brand new channel. The called juice? no something no boundaries oh all right oh goodness gracious anyway they're they're doing something uh in in house in the school that's uh athletics wide and they they talk about everything Kyle McCord was the first interview um he's a he's a pretty good interview he, i i'm kind of surprised that he didn't do better at ohio state although that's a uh, i mean the guy they they went 11 and 1 12 and 1 to 11 and Le- one. Yeah. Was it 11-1? Yeah. Oh, no, 11-2 and because they lost. Well, 11-2 the because they yeah. lost the bowl game. But yeah, if we're Which talking regular season. Still a fantastic record. It's not like Ohio yeah. State's had a bad record. So I, I was just kind of surprised. But he said something about um, uh, that. It, I, I don't know if they were trying to get him to say something about Ohio State, but he said that it was just, you know, Ryan Day wanted to go into one direction and he wanted to go into another. I don't know why as a quarterback he thought he could – dictate the direction but nevertheless he he decided going to syracuse was the best choice for him so i guess why would they recruit all right so and we've got ohio state fans in the chat and we love all of our fans and i'm not a, about to say something to try and alienate but why go why recruit kyle mccord if after one season you're just gonna move to a totally different system and I'm not saying that that's what they're doing. I don't think it's a totally different system because we talked about this on the last live stream or two live streams ago where we said Ohio State, they've got like they've got four quarterbacks that could all viably start this season. I th- I'm and I say that loosely. I'm not totally serious about that. I don't know their how they're doing in spring practice just yet. But there's like four quarterbacks. Will Howard, uh, what was it? Jalen J J Jaden something, Jalen something, Julian Sayan, Julian Sayan, uh, Will Howard, Julian Sayan, Devin Brown, Lincoln Kineholtz, who I think is supposed to be transferring come Monday. Tomorrow, I believe, is when the spring portal opens. Oh, yep, yep. And then the last one, goodness gracious, I can't remember his name. Um, in any case, they've got like a bunch of quarterbacks that represent two very different systems in in the room. So I guess my question is, why would they go after Kyle McCord and then start bringing in quarterbacks that are part of this different system? And then, honestly, Kyle McCord's concerns are kind of right. Like, they recruited him for a reason. He must have he must have thought that they were going in a particular direction, and then after one season, after one 11-1 and one season, Ryan Day's like, no, actually, we're going to go in a totally different season or a totally different direction. But then they pick up Will Howard, who... He can run, but it's not like he's a massive dual threat guy. I mean, he can absolutely run. Don't get me wrong, but he's not like, I mean, he's not a Justin Fields, you know, he's not Mm -hmm. even really a CJ Stroud. And I don't even think CJ Stroud was much of a runner, but he always felt like a dual threat quarterback to me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, aside from the fact that the guy is just an artist with the football, but in any case, I, I kind of feel like what McCord's saying is kind of right. Like, why would they record? Why would they recruit him just to then move in a different direction after a double-digit win season? Right. I don't, I don't know. know. Very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, Buckeyes Battlecry says, I attended the spring game in Columbus yesterday. Always a good time, but nothing close to game level excitement. Yes, yeah. agreed. We we went to a few spring games uh, years ago and actually stopped going because it was like, uh, kind of boring. <laughs> it, it's kind of boring. They did at Michigan. They used to do the um, uh, the alumni bowl. <laughs> Yeah, the flag football always, game. Yeah, which is always kind of fun because uh, Brandstatter and um, uh, oh, who's the other guy? Oh, anyway, Fr- Frank Beckman. Frank Beckman. Yeah, Brandstatter yeah. and Beckman used to get down on the field as announcers and like walk around on the field while they were playing. And then you had guys from you know years ago playing, and and it was kind of fun. A little flag football game. They stopped oh, doing that, I think, and then it wasn't as much fun. <laughs> yeah. What was it? Who? Who who was playing when we went there and and they the the quarterback threw the pass during that flag football game and it was a great pass hit the guy right in his hands he should have had it and but he dropped it and then Frank Beckman's like oh he put the ball in a bad spot right in his hands right in his hands <laughs> I don't remember who that was but I do remember that quote yeah oh Frank Beckman's a legend I love yeah. that guy yep at any rate we are going to live stream as we said the the uh, the Michigan spring game. So I know Buckeyes battle cry. I don't know if you'll be watching that, but we are going to try to make that more fun, more exciting. We'll see what we can do. Rod Farva is saying chip runs, chip runs more, but keep thinking what you saw in the spring game is exactly what you'll see during the season. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's fair. The, sp- yeah. the spring game doesn't reveal what they're going to do. If it did, they wouldn't play it. If it did, then last season's Michigan spring game would have indicated Michigan going eight and four. Nine and three. Right. They did not yeah. look good. No. Yeah. Their spring game was rather concerning last year. I remember yeah. yeah. I remember watching that thinking, uh oh, <laughs> I thought it was no. natty or bust. Yeah. Maybe next year. Yeah. <laughs> Ferris. Yo, yo, yo. Yo. <laughs> yo. Uh, oh, yeah. Connorstown 11 and two. OK, so we caught on to that. Well, um, to Michigan and Missouri. Both U of M's actually. Yes, indeed. Both with block M's as their logo, even. So. All right, yeah. yeah. Ferris, go blue. Go blue. Uh, let's see. I'm going to... <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, we're going to switch over to uh, viewer comments. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. These Some of these texts come in at the last second. Mm-hmm. Rod Farver says, Judkins is a physical back, but keep trolling. Oh, he's talking about... Oh, who said... Somebody said it earlier in the chat. Yeah. Uh, okay. Let us move on to viewer comments. Oops, I'm on the wrong one. I forgot. Oh, you didn't get to see my graphic right out of the gate. What well, sucks. Moving on to viewer comment. <laughs> <laughs> the comment we got this time, um, kind of a light week on comments, but uh, this one was kind of interesting. I, I think we can, Mac, you can tell me if you think this is interesting or not, but this comes from movies two, seven, four, two, three. And, uh, we were obviously we're talking about, this is from the, uh, the Penn state is being held back video, which was a cut from, uh, last week's live stream. And he said, PSU Penn state does have nice bowl wins. And probably this is the key part here. Probably the last meaningful big 10 championship game win and that's better than anything Brian Kelly won. Kelly won a few lower tier bowls at Notre Dame. His best two victories were probably 2012 at Oklahoma and 2020 Clemson at Notre Dame. So I responded to him and asked what he meant by last meaningful Big Ten championship. And here he says, I, I didn't say what I mean clearly. Going into that game, you didn't know who was going to win, and it was a good game. Since then, it's been obvious who was going to win. Penn State won the Big Ten championship. Oh, I, I looked it up and I just forgot the uh, the date Wasn't on that. Uh, two thousand tw- uh, crap. Two thousand twelve, two thousand eleven. Yeah, somewhere around there. And then it was basically after that because uh, I, I went back and looked at the the games after that, and I think he's right because the following games were essentially you know the the West Division was very weak, the East Division was very strong, and the games ended up being very lopsided. Oh, uh, 2016. Holy yeah. crap. I was so off. Yeah. Counter Stallions, right. Counter Stallions and Buckeye Battle Cry both. Uh, yeah. Thanks, guys. I don't know why I thought it was 2011. But again, <laughs> the games after that, the divisions were so lopsided 
the, the championship game didn't mean much. Certainly the, the last one between Michigan and Iowa, where Michigan blanks Iowa in one of the most boring championship games we've ever seen. Um, yeah. Maybe he's right. What do you think? Actually, what, what do you think about that? And what do you think the new setup will do to alleviate or to fix this? Well, I don't think that any any of the Big Ten championship games were meaningless or I don't know. How did he put it? The last meaningful Big Ten championship game win? Yeah. I Meaningful from what standpoint? From the fact that the East Division or West Division couldn't get their crap together? Like, well, is he- that... He mentions that in the second the second note there that you didn't know who was going to win going into that game. Oh, there well, was, yeah. Okay. There was the sense of not knowing who was going to win. It was it was a good that's, game. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, yeah. So that was 2016. It was a 38 31 victory over Wisconsin. You're right. That was. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> that was a good close game. But I guess I'm still going to say that it's not the East's fault that the West couldn't field a competent team after that. Um, mm-hmm. but it's also, I don't know, maybe it's the big 10 conferences fault for putting Penn state, Ohio state and Michigan all in one conference. Right. I, you know, so I guess, but, the, but I am glad that they're moving it away from divisions because yeah, this time we're going to get the two best teams in the big 10 championship game, you know, no matter what, from a statistical point of view, unless one team is just far and away better than everybody else and everybody else is, you know. I don't know, five and five, six and six, you know, Mm -hmm. that kind of crap. Anyway, the only thing that I don't like about the um, new format is that you're going to, I mean, the possibility of Michigan and Ohio State playing back to back. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that I don't like about it. It would be cool if we could get back to a system where it's, I don't know, you, where you don't have to rematch against somebody, I guess. But that's just right. not that's just not feasible at this point, given where college football is going, the landscape and all that. Guys, stop fighting in the chat. Holy crap. <laughs> Be nice. We're here to make football fun again, not to crap on each other. <laughs> you guys are distracted. We'll be right. me too, because I keep like I keep reading I keep the comment and trying to and then going back over to the to the to the chat here, like holy crap. Yep. Anyway. Well here, Connor Stallions agrees with me that last year's Michigan Iowa game could put a Roy Rage Roy, Roy Rage horse to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> it was it was boring and concerning at the beginning. It was a little concerning because Michigan wasn't doing anything. Yeah. And yet the game ends what, what was it, twenty nine to nothing? It, yeah, something oh. like that. I don't know. Yeah. I don't even remember because the game was so boring. Remember, was we were boring. we were just like talking, like just having normal conversation throughout that game because it was just so right. boring. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess is fine, but whatever. <laughs> Twenty six to zero. Twenty six to zero. Yeah. I love how we can't was remember it? the scores to any of the games. Yeah, it was twenty six to zero. Yeah. I could have sworn it was twenty nine. All right. Well, there no, we go. No, he's right. It was 26. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let us step into our first story. This one comes from the Detroit Free Press, relatively speaking. From Ohio State to Michigan football, Tony Alford embraces culture of toughness. And, okay, so this is the one where we were going to talk about, yeah, where we, I jokingly said we're going to try to put Ohio State in the worst possible light. This one has uh, sort of taken off on Twitter and all of the um, all of the socials, as they often do with people trying to put words in Tony Alford's mouth. Did he, you know, covertly say rude things about Ohio State? Um, let's let's get into what it what actually happened here. So one of the things he's quoted as saying at this press conference was there's just a culture of toughness, noted Alford, who replaced Mike Hart. They want to learn and play hard. Now, right off the bat, you can say this about the team you're on without it being insulting to the team you came from. Yeah. It is interesting, I guess, that that's the first thing he noted. But I don't want to put words in his mouth either. I I, I think that it's, it. I don't know. It is interesting that that's the first thing that he noted. And I wonder if it's, 
it's just simply because that's there, there's a difference in culture from Michigan to Ohio State. Like, it's not that Ohio State's culture is bad. I honestly don't know anything about Ohio State's culture, but maybe it has something more to do with the fact that Ohio State leans on a different style of play. Like, the way Michigan plays, they have to be tough. They're going to shove the ball down your throat every single play, whereas Ohio State has mm-hmm. finesse. They like to throw the ball around. Michigan tried to do that a little bit last year and actually had some decent success. J.J. McCarthy was really good throwing the ball. But what Michigan really likes to do is just hand it to Blake Corm or Donovan Edwards and tell the defensive line, good luck, and <laughs> see what happens. Um, that's why, I, I don't know, I could go on a tangent because uh, a whole lot of NFL people were saying, like, Michigan doesn't know what they had with, with J.J. McCarthy. And you're absolutely right, because we did not utilize him to the full extent of his capabilities. And that's probably because we have a culture of, toughness in that we run the ball a lot mm-hmm. yeah Buckeyes Battle Cry says the fact you use the word toughness as a direct shot at OSU it's entirely possible it, yeah it is um, possible yeah given that the word toughness has now been bandied back and forth thanks Lou Holtz <laughs> <laughs> And again, yeah, actually, here it was. After Lou Holtz claimed the Buckeyes lacked toughness, Ryan Day famously said at the win over Notre Dame, what he said about our team, I cannot believe this is a tough team right here. (laughs) They are a tough team. I'd like to know where Lou Holtz is right now. (laughs) As he savored a competitive 30-24 to victory over Ohio State last fall, former UM wideout Roman Wilson said, they want to act hard, but when we're out there, they're not hard. So Roman Wilson, who is actually on the field playing against them, yeah. Felt that Ohio State was was not tough. But again, and I don't know, I don't know why I'm I'm going this route necessarily. Uh, I guess I'm playing good cop. You get to be bad cop. All but right. but uh Roman Wilson on the field, this is post game and and post game after the fact, 2020 hindsight is always 2020. You always kind of look at, well, that I guess that wasn't as tough as I thought it was going to be because we won. Yeah. I mean, there is that element to that. And given that the the toughness word had already been thrown around, it makes sense that he would say something like that as a as a kid coming off a football game. Well, and he was taking a shot because, you know, the, he's he's also on on this team that's being accused of all sorts of um, cheating allegations and stuff like that. So he's hearing all the noise and he's He's taken all the crap and and he's, you know, hearing people say like Ohio State's defense is just going to crush you. Like you're not going to be able to do anything. And mm-hmm. Michigan did a lot. They probably should have done more. Not that Ohio State's defense was bad because they obviously weren't. They were an incredible team, guys. Like Right. But I think after that, I mean, cuz I don't want to I don't want to go on a rant about like, oh yeah, Ohio State was totally soft. Like they're not. You can't be soft and win 11 games. Right. You might be a little bit softer than Michigan because Michigan won 15 games, but that doesn't, I mean, maybe there are varying levels to soft. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Either way, I think Roman Wilson here was just kind of taking a post game shot because he was revved up. I mean, and I probably, I right. would have done the same thing. Like, yeah, they, you guys aren't hard. Like, what are you talking about? They probably gave him a ton of crap on the field, too. Right. Okay. Which so now more- one of the, one of the reasons they gave was the stat box from that game highlighted a larger trend that revealed Ohio State no longer demonstrated the same level of commitment to its ground attack as it did when it steamrolled Michigan during an eight-game winning streak that unfolded between 2012 and 2019. And yes, I remember all of that. Yep. Painfully, <laughs> painfully remember all of that. Um, who was it? Somewhere in the chat, somebody actually brought up that... Uh, uh, Chip Kelly does like to run the ball. Uh, that was somebody from last week. I can't remember who brought that up, um, that right? but they're right. I looked it up and Chip Kelly at UCLA, I think it was, had like a 52% run rate. So okay. he's basically 50, 50 pass run. So, okay. Then, then going back to McCord leaving, what was it? Did McCord want to pass more? You think? And, and now Ohio State's returning more to a, a balanced run pass game, but he wanted to pass more. I I'm really not sure because I mean it's not like McCord had wheels, so he's he's not that quarterback that you put the ball in his hands every single play and just let him make a play. 
I mean, he can make a play with his arm. He can and he can scramble a little bit, but it's not like from a play to place perspective, he was a dual threat quarterback. So mm-hmm. if you wanted to get the run game going, you had to hand the ball off. And against Michigan, anyway, Ohio State's offensive line wasn't good enough. So they weren't able to do that. I they weren't really able to do that a lot against other teams with with good defensive lines as well obviously they did it enough to be able to win 11 games but i guess i'm not really sure what kyle mccord wanted to do because it's not like i i mean they threw the ball a lot last year Mm -hmm. i think i can look that up and make sure but i'm i'm pretty sure they threw the ball a lot last year because the knock on ryan day was that he was starting to move away from the run game And that's one of the reasons Tony Alford came to Michigan, it sounds like. But now that Chip Kelly's there, maybe they'll start to lean a little bit more on the run game because he is pretty much 50-50 pass run. It just kind of depends on, I think, what Ryan Day wants to do. And Ryan Day, I believe, took over play calling at some point last season or gave it up. I can't remember. Um, But in any case, the knock was that they were moving away from the run game. So I really, I don't know what Kyle McCord wanted. That it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It could honestly yeah. be that Ryan Day told him before he transferred, like, no, actually, this whole pass first thing isn't working. So we're going to move towards a more 50 50 run pass kind of situation, get the run game going a little bit more. And Kyle McCord didn't want to do that. He wants to be able to sling the ball around as much as he wants. So maybe that's what yeah. happened. Uh, Buckeyes Balakrai points out that the winner in the game has won the rushing rushing yardage battle 22 years in a row. That's correct. So this this is a game won on the ground, which, again, makes it confusing as to why Ohio State backed off of the run game these last three years. Yeah. But so, OK, so they go on to talk about uh, Rainer Saban here at the Detroit Free Press talks about uh, the past season. The Buckeyes executed 33.2 rush attempts per game, which ranked 93rd in the FBS. In former OSU coach Urban Meyer's last full season, 2017, OSU ran the ball nearly nine more times on average and finished inside the top 20 in rushing output. Whether the gradual shift in offensive approach factored into Alford's exit is uncertain. And Alford, I'm betting, didn't really know that Chip Kelly was coming in. Which it kind of makes you wonder why. Well... No, because he was still there when Chip Kelly did did get hired, I think. So, yeah, that's actually kind of interesting. I have a feeling that Ryan Day is trying to move a little bit more towards the run game this season. Yeah. Which I think is why they went after Quinshaw Junkins in the portal. Um, my thing is, though, is that they've always had great running backs. It's the offensive line that was really good against inferior D lines, but couldn't get it done against better D or better. Yeah. Better D lines like mm-hmm. Michigan. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Finally, Alfred just said, he just thought it was time. Uh, you make moves professionally that you feel are in your best interest. So I, mm-hmm. whatever is going on, Alfred, Alfred here, I think is taking the high road and just saying, look, it was, you know, it's just time. It's just professional. It's just, just a job, which is nice. So he's not taking shots or doesn't seem like he's taking shots at anybody, but yeah, again, who knows? Yeah. Um, looking at a couple of chats here. So Buckeyes battle cry is saying there's a lot more competition than just Ohio state this year. You've got Texas and Oregon. Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to skip over that one. Uh, 2019 and 2020, we ran fine. After that, we didn't have that guy at running back, plus our O-line development was lacking. Yeah, I, that's that's the biggest thing. It's Actually, yeah, 2019 and 2020, the running the ball, I believe, went pretty well for them. Um, I can't remember exactly. 2020, I, I, I try to block out of my mind because that sucked. Yeah. It's awful. But um, yeah, I, I think that that's a good point that the O-line, the O-line development and the O-line recruiting, I think, has kind of dipped a little bit under Ryan Day as opposed to Urban Meyer. And I'm not saying it's bad, like Ohio State is still recruiting, you know, good O-line men. I just feel like they're not getting everything that they can out of their O-line. 
mm-hmm. which is why they can they can still beat up on lesser teams. But when they come up against Michigan, who has NFL talent at uh, D line every single season, it's not getting it done. Right. Mac seventy seven. Ooh, hi. hello, Mac. <laughs> My name is Mac too. <laughs> McCord's dad wanted him a guarantee that he would start next year, and Ryan wouldn't agree. And that's where I think McCord uh, really was out of line. I don't think he could ask for that. I don't think any player yeah. can ask for that. You you win the spot or you don't. You can't demand to have the spot. That's yeah. That's kind of an entitlement attitude. And honestly, as a dad, he should really be ashamed of himself if that's true. Like you don't that's teach true. your kid like you want guarantees that you're going to get something out of out of life or you know, some sort of position or something like that. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you don't get it, then you just pout and leave. Like, no, you work for it. Rod Farber says again that Alfred's uh, poor recruiting and development hurt OSU the last three seasons. I really got to look into this because I've got one side saying that Alfred's, every guy that was a starter that trained under Alfred went to the NFL. But also, and I, I think actually, I think Rod may have pointed this out before. Maybe it was Buckeyes Battle Cry that those weren't necessarily guys he trained up. Those were guys that were already being trained up when he got there. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I I mean, he can't be that bad if he got hired at Ohio State and gets hired at Michigan. It's not like it's not like either of those schools is going to purposely hire somebody who isn't good at his job. I okay. So I've, I've got some stats on it real quick. Right. And these are official. Okay. All right. <laughs> so Tony Alford developed six 1,000 yard running backs in his nine seasons at Ohio State. Six. Um, that includes Ezekiel Elliott in 2015, Mike Weber in 2016, who was actually supposed to be a Michigan commit, I think. Pretty sure that's how that worked. Uh, and then J.K. Dobbins in 17, 18, and 19, and then Travion Henderson in 2021. Travion Henderson, under Tony Alford, became just the fourth true freshman in program history to surpass 1,000 yards. Um, his rushing total of 1,248 yards was second only to another Alford uh, protege, J.K. Dobbins. So... If he can't recruit, he can develop. But I, but, but, all of these years, <clears throat> except for nineteen and twenty-one, all of these years are underneath Urban Meyer, and Urban Meyer was a developer. He was extremely good at finding good talent and using that talent in a system that bettered the talent. But then as the talent became better, it exponentially made the team better. So they were able to reach heights that other coaches could really only dream of. Ryan Day doesn't seem to have that ability, and maybe that's the difference. Maybe Tony Alford is a really good coach underneath a head coach that is able to um, be a better CEO than Ryan Day is. Maybe that's what's going on here. And again, none of this is a knock on Ryan Day because the guy's 56 and nine or two or some nonsense against everybody but Michigan. So he's a great coach, but maybe he's just not. I mean, you're basically talking about uh, you're trying to compare. I don't know. um, Silver to gold. I mean, if Urban Meyer is the gold (laughs) standard, then Ryan Day is the silver standard. And Ohio State fans have gotten so so used to the gold standard that silver is just not cutting it, which I totally get. This season, Michigan's expected not to do as well as the last three. I will be disappointed. It'll probably still be a good season. Probably. It's kind of okay. sucks to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rod Farber also says that Alfred uh, pretty much had to interview to keep his job after the bowl game. He was given a one-year deal and a pay cut. He was on the hot seat, and Michigan bailed him out. Actually, that I can believe because that yeah. bowl game was so awful. <laughs> everybody, but everybody uh, sat out. 
That was right. the opt out poll. Like everybody sat that game out. So yeah. you can't really you can't really judge a coach's performance on a bowl game when you've got everybody that you've been working with all season long then decide that they're just not going to play this last game, which again, it's a business decision, so I get it. But then all of a sudden he's got to start working with running backs and an offensive line that they're not going to get anything done. I mean, okay, I'm I'll take a little bit of a shot here against Ohio State. Their O line didn't have the best depth. So when a bunch of their starters sit out, and honestly, it doesn't fall back entirely on the O-line either. They had starters sitting out everywhere. Uh, off topic, Jobin Hubley says, ha ha, I'm back. Remember me? Yes. Do you? Actually. It All sounds right. familiar. Very nice. Well, nice to have you back, Jobin. <laughs> Hi, Jobin. Hope you're well. <laughs> uh, Jim Bob Knowles. Pit cup says nope. I don't know why, but he did. He said that. I don't know what a pit cup is, but I feel like I also don't want to. Know. Wait, Jim Bob Knowles spit cup. That's what that is. Oh, spit cup. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness, I'm way behind on the chats here. That's fine. <laughs> Red Farber says Alfred didn't sign a single our running back in 2023. All right. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that was one year. Yeah. Uh, he also says you're in denial. I assume he's talking to you and not me. <laughs> That's, fair. That's fair. I appreciate you still watching, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. <clears throat> Antoine speaking facts. Uh, this is from Counter Stallions. Without an O-line run, no run game will succeed. Dobbins succeed with an O-line. Your O-line sucks. Your running backs, even prime Barry Sanders would suck. That's not true. Prime Barry Sanders would do just fine. <laughs> but again, Ohio State's offensive line does not suck. They just weren't as good as Michigan's defensive line. I mean, and for three years, but still, they beat everybody else except for Missouri. Right? Yeah. Right. Except for Missouri. But that's yeah. because everybody opted out. So what you're talking about here is a team that is really good. They just weren't as good as Michigan. And that's okay because for eight years, Michigan was pretty good. They just weren't as good as Ohio state. These, these, these things happen in football guys. Like we can, we can be okay with this things. You know, they change. I got to disagree with a little bit. Those eight years, uh, only half of them, Michigan was pretty good. I mean, if we're talking 12, 13, and 14, those were awful oh, years. Well, okay, we don't talk about that. Yeah. yeah. That's fair. That's a fair. Uh, to close out this particular story, Go Blue, Go Blue asks, has anything been heard of, about Mike Hart? No, I haven't heard anything. I've been I looking mean, yeah. to see if anything gets said, but um, so far there, there hasn't been anything. Yeah, I haven't heard anything either. The last rumor I heard was that he was out at Michigan because of health reasons. Yeah. And he hasn't eight. taken a job anywhere else either. No. So, uh, yeah, I hope he's doing okay. I hope everything's fine over there. Let us jump to story number two. This comes from Wolverine's Wire, our old friend who doesn't have any idea who we are. Isaiah Hole says, uh, the headline is, former Michigan football coach joins Ohio State staff. This is Tim Drevno. And the reason this story stands out is for the same reason that Isaiah po- points it out in the story is that uh, it seemed to be wrong for Alfred to leave Ohio State to go to Michigan, but it seems to be okay for Drevno to go to Ohio State. Granted, Drevno did not make a direct route from Michigan to Ohio State, but here, let's get into the story. Jim Harbaugh's first offensive coordinator in Ann Arbor, Tim Drevno, is joining the Buckeyes as an analyst. Um, I had forgotten about him. I guess I didn't know. No, I, I guess I just forgot about him. I didn't know who the uh, I was following the OCs and the DCs at the time. But uh, so here are, the, here are the points. Ohio State has hired longtime O-line coach Tim Drevno, quality control coach for the Buckeyes, worked with Chip Kelly. This is the fun part because it's we're we're just going back and forth with coaches in the Big Ten now, just sort of swapping coaches out um, yeah. because – uh, Tim Drevno here worked with Chip Kelly for the past three seasons at UCLA, which were bad. 
<laughs> he but was what, let. What was his position? <laughs> what was his? But he. I think he was. Was he? Oh, I don't know. Was he the O line coach over there? I'm not sure. We'll have to I look that know. up. I will look that up. Look that up. So he was let go last month by Deshaun Foster, the brand new, untried head coach at UCLA, who has never been a head coach before, who took over for the Bruins when Kelly left to become Ohio State's offensive coordinator. Just massive switching back and forth here. I So Drevno, now, so Drevno has more of a tie to Jim Harbaugh than he does to Michigan. He was a longtime Jim Harbaugh disciple, coaching with him at Stanford and San Francisco before joining him in Ann Arbor making this more of a shot off the bow at Harbaugh than it is Michigan football, which I I don't know. I, I'm not sure why Isaiah had to say that, but he did. It just seems like it's, I don't know. I, the reason, I think the reason we wanted to look at this story is just because of the, the interesting switch trades back and forth and coaches, but I don't know that this yeah. was a shot at anybody. All right, what, I mean, do you, what do you think? The guy was hired as a quality control analyst. If this was a shot at Michigan or at Harbaugh, it's like from a squirt gun. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, he was a longtime Jim Harbaugh disciple, coaching with him at Stanford and the San Francisco 49ers before joining it, joining him in Ann Arbor. Jim Harbaugh is not at Michigan anymore. Jim Harbaugh is with the Chargers. Right. Uh, Chip Kelly, on the other hand, is at Ohio State. So if Tim Drevno has the connection with Chip Kelly, it makes sense. He goes to Ohio State with him because Jim Harbaugh didn't want him with the Chargers. Mm-hmm. Boom. Done. <laughs> that's all that's what I got. That's it. That's you know. And and this was kind of uh my reaction to Connor Stallion says my reaction to the story is Tim Drevno Tim Drev who? Tim Drev who all right, and that's not yeah. entirely fair, though, because Tim Drevno did have some seriously good uh, offense uh, offenses at Michigan. Mm-hmm. Well, seriously good is subjective, I guess. Um, so in 2016, Michigan had the fifth, or Michigan's offense had the fifth highest single season point total in program history which trailed only the point-a-minute teams of 1901 to 1904. So how about that? All right. Uh, 10 of 11 offensive starters that year earned all-conference recognition, and Michigan led the Big Ten in scoring for the second straight season. So they were actually not bad. (laughs) They were really good. And and reading that honestly makes me really upset that we lost to Ohio State that many times. Like, holy crap. (laughs) Seriously, we led the Big Ten with 40 points a game for two seasons, and we couldn't beat them? Wait, which seasons were those? Uh, That would have been 2015 and 2016. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. 2016 was the season where Michigan basically would have been undefeated except for what they were. They missed it by five points. Yeah, they were and that was over from, three yeah. games. Yeah, Two that games. was heartbreaking. Well, I think it was three. no, and the bowl game, and the bowl game. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that was the season that we actually we lost at Iowa on a walk off uh, field goal. The Iowa Hawkeyes hit that walk off field goal, yeah. and I was still at Western at the time, and I think it was probably ten o'clock at night, and I had to go for a walk, so I literally walked <laughs> from my apartment like two miles to downtown and then back like I, screaming I the entire way. <laughs> yeah. All of the, all of the gang activity that was going on around me, you know, the gunshots and drugs going on and stuff like that didn't phase me at all. I was just like, why did we lose <laughs> to Iowa? Uh, Connor Stallions agrees with you. Hey, you said this, right? He was the O-line OC coach at UCLA. No, at UCLA. wait, no. Yes. He was yeah. the offensive line coach. He was not the offensive coordinator. He was the offensive line coach, uh, but he was also the run game coordinator. All right. There you go. There we yeah. go. Uh, and again, yeah, go blue, go blue. A little late for a shot at Jim. Yep, agreed. Well, yeah. I also want to put this out there. Jake Rudock will forever be one of my favorite Michigan quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. Um 
I understand he wasn't the flashiest. I get it. But he is only the second quarterback, the second in program history to pass for 3,000 yards in a season. Mm -hmm. And people get mad at Harbaugh for not throwing the ball more. Right. He threw the ball. Uh, Rod Farva says, OSU and Michigan have had many coaches who have coached at both places. This is absolutely true. In fact, Bo Schembechler, our you know, coaching patron saint at Michigan, trained under Woody Hayes. So, at Ohio State. At Ohio State, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Connor Stallings wants to know if you were alive to see those games in 1904. I was, actually. <laughs> I am a time traveler. Also, I have a really good skincare routine, which is why I don't look my age, which is 120. So, all right. Yeah. Antoine says he thinks Jake Rudock. Blah. Sorry, I got a bit of a throat thing going on here. So, I'm going to see how long I last. I think Jake Rudolph. <laughs> and there it goes. <laughs> I think Jake Rudock left a year too early. He should have stayed one more year. We would have been great. He could have stayed another year. I th I thought he was a senior. Although I guess maybe he had maybe, some eligibility there. Well, I think he was a graduate transfer, actually. Yeah. But if he had one more year of eligibility. Holy crap, dude! Yeah, you should have stayed. And in 2016, we would have won everything. Oh mm. my gosh, we would have probably. That would have made 2016 a lot different. Yeah, that's for I, sure. Actually, I think because I don't blame Wilton Spate for much, but he did throw a pick six in the Ohio State game, and mm -hmm. he fumbled the ball on the Ohio State one yard line. So I like Wilton Spate, but Jake Rudock's not going to make that mistake. Oh, man, we would have won yeah. that game. We would have <laughs> won that game. <laughs> Shoot. Oh, we got some good ones here. Uh, Connor Stallion says, simple, didn't have a QB. Michigan lost to Iowa 14-11 and got screwed by the refs at their house 30-27. to Lost a controversial game versus Jimbo Fisher. Oh, yeah. Oh, Iowa did, yeah. No, 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 no. We lost the bowl game to Florida State. Remember, because we missed oh. the... We missed the first half because we were at a Trans-Siberian Orchestra concert. <laughs> That's right, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we were like, oh, yeah. well, we're not we stopped guys. At, Who cares? Yeah. Then we stopped at B-dubs to watch the second half. Right. Yeah. Rod Farber chiming in. Bo has a degree from OSU. Back then, grad assistants had to take classes while coaching. Oh, yep. fascinating. All right. They don't know? I don't know. <laughs> old Timer 56. I have a Michigan fan hey. since 1969. Oh, yeah. Old Timer 56. Good to see you again. Uh, and I followed them closely over the years. 1969, of course being the year that uh, Bo Schembechler started and beat Ohio State, which is a fantastic game. Yeah. Uh, I was not there to see it. I have only seen it on video because I wasn't even born then. So uh, Michigan versus Ohio State games were great every year with a great respect between the schools and the fan bases. Yes, absolutely. That was the lead into the 10-year war. Um, just two evenly matched teams just going at it every year. It was a fantastic game. Uh, and even into the, um, that would have been in the seventies, even through the eighties, it was still, uh, it, it wasn't the 10 year war. I'm trying to remember when Woody Hayes, uh, was fired <laughs> <laughs> for punching the Clemson player. I think so. Um, but whenever that was the eighties were still good, uh, yeah. still good games there. Rod Farber disagrees with you on spate. Spate was so bad. <laughs> yeah, that that's because the only game you watched him was the Ohio State game. So <laughs> it could be. Also, oh, Woody, Hay Woody Hayes was fired in 1978. Okay, that makes sense then. All right. I think Rudock was a fifth year senior, didn't have any more eligibility, just a guess. That's what I thought. I thought he was brought in um because I it was strange to me because uh I thought Harbaugh brought in Rudock knowing that he only had one year with him and it just seemed odd because you can't develop somebody in one year. Although Rudock already had some serious natural talent. Yeah. But well and, and Harbaugh needed a needed a quarterback to get things started too. Michigan, I don't think, had a quarterback because Devin Gardner twenty fourteen was his last year, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yes. 
So yep. he, he needed to bring in somebody. I mean, yeah, and that was, right away. Yeah, that was a smart choice, too, because Iowa was running basically the same offense he wanted to. Mm-hmm. And yeah, Jake Rudock was a graduate student when he played quarterback at Michigan. He was immediately eligible for the 2015 season, but it doesn't look like he was eligible for 2016. Ah. So. Connor Stallions also says the 2016 was kind of overrated. Majority of the 40 points per game was off that Rutgers wipeout. Oh, yeah. I actually felt bad for Rutgers in that game. I don't care. <laughs> yes. I felt bad for Rutgers that game, too. But still don't care. That team was amazing, and you can you can shove it or something. Yep. That was – okay, so that was one of those games that Michigan kept scoring, and it's it's where you sort of – well, I do anyway. I calculate it out where, okay, they scored this many points in the first quarter. If they maintain that, they're going to end up here, you know, acting like it's going to be equivalent all the way through, knowing that by the time you get to the fourth quarter, if you're that far ahead, they're putting in second stringers, third stringers, fourth stringers. And I remember that score just going up and up and up, and Michigan had the fourth stringers in it. And I'm just like, I'm I'm legitimately starting to feel bad for Rutgers. <laughs> This is bad. They are being decimated and there's nothing they can do about it. <laughs> Rutgers didn't get a first down until the third quarter, right? I think so. Yeah. I don't remember all the that stats was, of that one, but it was, they were, they were just doing nothing. Yeah. Nothing I'm, pretty was sure, them. I'm pretty sure it was the third quarter. And when they got it, their stadium went nuts. Mm-hmm. Like, ouch. <laughs> is it horrible if I go to the bathroom? It might be. Then I have to do this on my own. I believe in you. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> it's just, you know, 30 seconds. It's right. It's right, right there. I'll just, you know, real quick and just, you know. All right. I'll try to keep this going. Talk to the people. They're cool. All right. <laughs> okay, guys. So while Mac disappears for a second, um, how are things, how, with how things are now, Rudot can still have eligibility. Oh, that's probably true. I uh, given that, um, man, they get what they, uh, they're bringing in. Oh no. Oh no. Who's the quarterback that's coming back. Tuttle Tuttle is in what is seventh or eighth year. It's insane that they're getting this level of eligibility. I remember it used to be old timer 56 you can back me up on this. It used to be, you know, you were a freshman, junior, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and then you graduated and you were done. And it's just not that way anymore. I do remember, uh, who was the team? I think it was Northwestern a few years ago had a guy who was a Navy SEAL that came back to play and he was 35 years old, but he hadn't played before. So he had four years of eligibility. I think it was four years of eligibility at 35 years old. Either that or he had like one year of eligibility left. I don't know. But the guy being a Navy SEAL was just running circles around some of these other kids. So that was kind of wild. Um, let's see here. Let's go over to Connor Stallion says Michigan was up like 31, nothing at halftime ran for like 450 yards, just ran the ball and still was scoring. If I remember correctly. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That, yeah, that's close enough. It might've even been more than 31 at the time because uh, I mean, they were putting in third stringers at halftime or after at the beginning of the third quarter. So it was insane. That game was just in some respects, a travesty. <laughs> I mean, for Rutgers. Well, yeah. But... Antoine says Spate was okay. He was McNamara <clears throat> without the complicated great running game or the offensive line. And? <laughs> uh, he's probably right. He's probably right. He's probably, I mean, he, Spate would probably be what you would call a game manager. But, okay, I don't know. I just, I never like to crap on the quarterbacks because they have the world's hardest job yeah i had while you were gone i was we were talking about eligibility and i brought up tuttle being in year seven or eight. Oh yeah and yeah that's just crazy yeah, all he's right a he's a what <laughs> <laughs> i was joking but i said he's oh. a grandpa. <laughs> I'm like how's that even possible <laughs> okay. okay sorry <clears throat> all right. Serious ethical questions about in vitro fertilization all of a sudden. <laughs> I don't know. It made sense in my head. 
Our last story of the evening is the spring 2024 Big Ten Power Rankings coming from Athlon Sports. We decided we want to get into this because we want to start looking forward here. Um, it's been interesting talking about coaches and all that. Although next week we're going to really dig into uh, recruiting. Um, see what we can uh, find out there, especially with the transfer portal opening up on Monday and the spring games. Let's see. There's actually more spring games in April. I think there's spring games. Well, there's one this Saturday, and I believe the following Saturday. Yeah. Um, I think there's actually a couple of teams not doing a spring game, and I'm trying to remember which ones those were. But at any rate, so here we are. So Athlon Sports uh, put out a list of all the Big Ten teams and put them in uh, you know power ranking order. And what we are going to do is go through this in reverse order, starting with number 18. Uh, we're going to look at what Athlon said uh, briefly, and then Mac is going to tell us if he agrees with them being at that level um, or what he also believes the team needs to work on. So, Mac, are you ready? No, but let's give it a shot. <laughs> let's give it a shot. All right. <laughs> Coming in at number 18 are the Purdue Boilermakers. Purdue. Purdue Boilermakers. What to watch? What to watch on offense? Dion Burks is a transfer has transferred to Oklahoma. TJ Sheffield has transferred to Michigan State. This alone is telling that the only thing Athlon pointed out was the transfers out, not any transfers in. On defense, that well, it, defense or not, Ryan Walters is in his second year and five starters are returning on defense. So, Mac, would you put uh, Purdue at 18 down at the bottom? And what else do you see that they need to work on? So, yeah, they, they, they got rated. Uh, by the transfer portal, for sure. Um, and last season was definitely a bit of an issue for them. I don't know that I would actually put them at number 18, though. Um, I'm just looking at their their transfer class real quick here. And they've got a three-star edge rusher coming in from Georgia. They've got another three-star edge rusher coming in from Boston College. they got a, a receiver coming in from... Uh, UCLA, if I remember correctly, that's actually a really big need for them because Purdue's, um, I think their wide receiver room is basically empty at this point. So they really needed to fill that out. They needed to, well, and they did. They've actually got two more three-star wide receiver commits, uh, both of whom are coming from Georgia. So they basically just raided Georgia's third stringer, second stringers. And and put together a wide receiver room with all of them. So I don't know. Good on them, I guess. Um, the only thing that I think is kind of questionable about them is I don't remember a lot in terms of how their defense specifically played last year. But I don't know that it entirely matters because I don't know that they're bringing in the type of talent. And I don't know that Ryan Walters is the type of coach to have um to have a second year team with the type of talent that he does have do very well against the current big 10. So I probably would have put Purdue a little bit higher than 18, just based on what I know about some of the other teams. Um, but yeah, maybe this is right. I uh, just, yeah. just real quick, jumping over to the chat. And this doesn't have to do with Purdue. It has to do with Michigan. Rod Farva says, Michigan players I hated. Hart, Desmond, Lawan, Peppers, and Winovich. The only thing I want to say to that, Rod, is you're wrong. Now, <laughs> <laughs> coming in at number 17, the Indiana Hoosiers. What to watch on offense? They have a new head coach, Kurt Signetti, who has done uh, fantastic at other schools. Curtis Rourke is a transfer from Ohio State. Return of receiver Donovan McCulley. Um, on defense, they averaged 33.8 points uh, allowed per game in 23, and they have seven starters returning. So what do you think, Mac? Yeah, this one's going to be an interesting um, an interesting one to watch. So the, the transfer from Ohio State, that's really interesting. I don't know what his position is, though, um, but I'm not entirely sure it matters because Kirk Signetti is kind of doing a full rebuild. Um Look, I, I think Tom Allen, he, he was a good defensive mind, but it just didn't really translate. And it doesn't really translate, especially to a team like Indiana that I feel like doesn't have the resources to really build the type of team that would actually be 
competitive in the current Big Ten. This is why I think teams like Indiana, Northwestern, and Purdue are going to end up needing to leave the Big Ten to create another sort of, I don't know, call it group of five level conference that they would then be able to be competitive in, um, which kind of brings up the idea of the tiered system and, and relegation and stuff like that. The one thing I will say, though, is that Kirk Signetti did um, bring in 22 transfer uh, transfer recruits, three of which they expect to make an immediate impact uh, this season. So they brought in, um, I don't know his first name, but McDonald. I can't remember his first name. Um, he, I believe, was actually a three-star and had initially signed with Iowa, um, but then transferred to Troy and is now transferring to uh, Indiana. He's got some injury uh, history, so they'll have to keep an eye on that, but he could be a potential immediate impact for them as well. Um, that being said, they are picking up a little bit of steam in terms of recruiting and all that. They've, they've got LeBron Bond, a four-star receiver, um, who just committed to, to uh, Indiana, but obviously he's not coming in this year. Um, yeah, I think, I think this is probably a good level for them. I, I would definitely have them above Purdue. Although I thought Purdue should have been higher. I think this is a good level for Indiana. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Sideline uh, one more time here. So Rod says, I missed this question. Uh, question just for fun. Who are five OSU players in your lifetime that you would have taken at Michigan? And who are the five players in your lifetime that you hated? Ooh. So this, this precipitated him saying that he hated those guys at Michigan. Um, gotcha. I'm, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I have a difficult time naming players from other teams, but I do know this. From my perspective, I would take every quarterback OSU has had in the last 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think they would have dramatically changed uh, Rich Rod's time and Brady Hoke's time and uh, those first few seasons for Michigan. I Well, I mean, what, was, what was that year that... Um, uh, they had three basically starting quarterbacks. Was that? Uh, oh yeah. Th that wasn't that twenty seventeen. Twenty seventeen. Some there, somewhere in there because we actually it, Michigan was doing so poorly that the only thing we could hope for was that Ohio State's quarterback got injured. Not that, and and I. <laughs> I bite my tongue saying that because I know I, I don't want to see these kids injured. I, I don't mean that at all, but, but he did get injured and their second string quarterback was better. And then I think he got taken yeah. out and the third string quarterback was just as good. And we're like, how, how does that happen? So yeah, that was, um, wasn't that, uh, Oh my goodness. It wasn't Justin Fields. Wasn't it the guy before him? J JT Barrett. I think it was because it was that game where, um, uh, not Denard, Devin Gardner, Gardner, Gardner came out and actually prayed with him on the field. I think that, yeah, okay, yeah, because then uh, Cardell Jones came in at one point and mm -hmm. just shredded, but then Cardell Jones came in. I thought he wasn't he the one that helped them win the national title that year. That could have been. I, I I'm remember. fuzzy on those details. Yeah, I don't know. But then as far as that goes, the five players in my lifetime that I've hated, same group. <laughs> For the same reason. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> Going on to number 16, Illinois, the fighting Illini. And my goodness, I would have expected more here from Athlon, but what to watch on offense? Uh, QB Luke Altmeyer is in year two and his passing attack and defense was just all question marks. Keeping in mind, Illinois' defense was doing much better when Ryan Walters was there as the D.C. I don't know what to expect from Illinois at all. I, I honestly don't. Um, I, I want to pull up their 2024 recruiting real quick. And, yeah, they're at, that, they're at number 15 in the Big Ten. Um. I mean, Rutgers has a better recruiting class than Illinois right now. I just don't know what to expect from them. I have no idea. Their defense, 
they, they were in so many games last year, I, if I remember correctly, and, and just found ways to lose them. So, yeah, I, I don't know what to expect from them. I would actually probably have put Indiana and Purdue above Illinois, to be completely honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Kevin Chavez here agrees with you. Indiana could be number 18. Uh, um, what? No, I think I think that's kind of different. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, because I think I think Indiana should be above Purdue, but Illinois should oh. be below both of them, mm-hmm. in my opinion. So I'm looking uh, just real quick. I'm looking some stuff up and. Um, they've lost, so they've lost a few transfer portal players. They've got some, uh, some players leaving. They went through some coaching changes. So they brought in a new linebackers coach, uh, Antonio Fenelis. Um, the defensive backs coach, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Andy Buh and Antonio Fenelis were both fired, um, after the 2023 season. So then they're bringing in George McDonald. Um, no, they're not. He left and went to Ole Miss. And then, <laughs> and then Charlie Bullen, their outside linebackers coach, um, left for the New York Giants. So aside from the fact that their 2024 recruiting class is currently number 30 nationally, which honestly feels really good to me considering they're, it's Illinois, um, that's bolstered mostly by the fact that their uh, their transfer class totals fourteen new players. I guess they're bringing in a good transfer class. Point is, I have absolutely no idea what to expect from them, and I I don't think that they're going to be very good. And honestly, I think Brett Bonlima, I, I think that he's going to be on the hot seat soon too. Yeah, I, I can't imagine he won't be. And that is fascinating to me, given what he did at Wisconsin and Arkansas. The guy's a good coach. The guy's a tough coach, and he is oh, not getting yeah. any traction at Illinois. I yeah, I don't I don't understand why. Like he wasn't an SEC coach, but then Illinois is just not a program that's positioned very well in the Big Ten. So right. I honestly don't think any coach would do well at Illinois. Yeah. Also, they're bringing in seven transfers, so I don't know where that 14 came from, but whatever. Side note from Old Timer 56, never hated any OSU players, more like admired how good some of them were in respect to the rival. Yes. Amen. Right on. Agreed. Completely agree with that. Uh, Rod Farva says he's got 2017, JT Barrett, Dwayne Haskins, and Joe Burrow. Yeah. Was was that? Joe I'm not sure that's the right one, though. That's, I'm, I'm not Burrow? sure that's the one I'm thinking of. Uh, uh, Connor Stallion says Cardell Jones. I think it was Cardell, the, the year that Cardell we, Jones was there. Yeah, whatever year Cardell Jones came into the Michigan game, that's the one that we're talking about. All right. Because then he went pro, like, right after that. Mm-hmm. 2014, Braxton was supposed to be the starter and missed the season, so JT Barrett won the job, but then broke his leg against Michigan. Cardell finished the season. Okay, that's the one. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Just, I mean, it was just astounding how good those guys were. Yeah. Uh, all right. Coming in at number 15, the Minnesota Golden Gophers. What to watch on offense? Uh, is Max Brommer, Brosmer settled at quarterback? They have a solid ground game, four starters returning. On defense, eight starters return, new play caller with Corey Heatherman taking over for Joe Rossi. And, of course, we have the issue at Minnesota. Has P.J. Fleck reached a ceiling? Is he going to get anywhere does 2024 look any better? Mac, what say you? I don't, I mean, I don't think so because it feels like he's constantly having to rebuild his offense. Now he's, he's either rebuilding the defense or he's rebuilding the offense from year to year. So yeah, they lost their, <laughs> they lost their defensive coordinator, um, Joe Rossi to Michigan state, I believe, which is a, Big deal to me because that means that Joe Rossi thinks that the Michigan State, the same position at Michigan State, is a better situation for him than what's going on in Minnesota. And that's kind of telling to me 
So what's going on at Minnesota that that they can't build the way because PJ Fleck is a super talented coach. If PJ Fleck were given the type of program that like Michigan or Alabama or Ohio State is, I feel like they'd be in contention for for national championships every single year. But um, Minnesota is just not getting. I think Minnesota is not getting the types of players that they need. Because I do believe that P.J. Fleck is a good developer. He was a great developer at Western Michigan, pulled in a ton of threes and fours and made them really good players. Um, I just the, the same thing is not really happening at Minnesota, and I'm honestly not really sure why that is. Now, they lost their starting quarterback from last year to uh, Rutgers in the transfer portal. Kind of bizarre. But the fact that that happened, plus they've got coaches leaving, Plus, he's just never able to break that that ceiling. I mean, they, they're making bowl games, but they're not winning any of the big games. And then he always, if you notice his press conferences, after he loses to teams like Michigan and Ohio State, he just always looks like he has no idea what to do. I mean, that press yeah, conference like he just last got season, punched in the face multiple times and he doesn't know where yeah, he is anymore. Yeah. Hey, yeah. It, that, that press conference after the Michigan game last year was just like a guy who had just gone – yeah, we're never going to be that good. I don't yep. I don't at all know what to do about that because they're just they're really good. Mm-hmm. Um from a talent standpoint or at least the fact that they've got PJ Fleck, I feel like this is about right, although I would probably have put them closer to 16 or 17. Um but given what we've talked about with the other teams so far, I think this feels about right. All right. We got some good comments in the chat here. Uh, Connor Stallion says, uh, no, Minnesota is in for another 6-6 six and six season. That may be. Yeah. Uh, Rod Farber agrees it's hard to recruit players to Minnesota. I think uh, P.J. Fleck sure. actually spoke to this uh, in the towards the end of the season, or at the end of the season, uh, saying that NIL is, is going to hurt teams like Minnesota in this way because – They'll come to Minnesota as freshmen and, and he'll develop them as freshmen and sophomores. And then they'll hit the transfer portal their junior year and go to your to Michigan, Ohio State, Alabama, wherever they can, wherever they can get more money if they've been developed that way. And so Minnesota just ends up being a feeder team. So how do you recruit top mm-hmm. players? You end up recruiting three stars, two stars and three stars and develop them up. But and then, that's what and then they ditch. That's what Illinois is becoming, too. I mean, that's what these these bottom feeder teams, if you will, and that's a horrible thing to say, but for lack of a better word, that's what these teams are becoming. Your well, Illinois, not bottom feeder, feeder teams, just feeder teams. No, I know, but I'm I'm saying like teams that are at the, the worst. Bottom tier. <laughs> bottom wow. tier, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's what these bottom tier teams are kind of becoming, are just feeder teams to the better teams. So you've got players from like I'm looking at Illinois' recruiting class right now. Actually, I might as well just pull up Minnesota's real quick. But what I'm thinking is happening is that you've got players coming in from better teams that are, that aren't doing as well, or they're riding the bench so they can go and and they're good enough to be starters somewhere else. So they transfer to that school, but these starters at these feeder teams realize that they're actually good enough to potentially get a roster spot or starting position at a better team. And so there's just constant roster turnover. So yeah, Minnesota is going to stay a a feeder team because they've got like, so they've got a, a Christian Christian driver is a wide receiver transfer from Penn State. I don't know. I That name sounds familiar, but I don't believe he was a starter, and he certainly wasn't exactly a star at Penn State. So he's transferring to Minnesota. Why? Because that's probably a better situation for him. But then Minnesota is losing players to Rutgers and to other places. Rutgers doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but sure, okay, maybe maybe this means that Max Brosmer was actually going to beat out Ethan Kaliak Manis for the starting job at Minnesota, and Kaliak Manis needed to go somewhere else that needed a quarterback if he wanted to get any starting uh, get a starting position. So this could end up being an upgrade for Minnesota at quarterback, but the offense has four starters returning. So any way you slice it, their offense isn't going anywhere this season. And it's because they can't keep a, a roster. They they just can't keep players. Uh, Go Blue, Go Blue asks, uh, didn't Fleck turn down some good gigs? I thought uh, there was a USC thing in there. 
Uh, I had not heard about USC. I just looked it up, and there was a rumor in February that he was a candidate for the UCLA job. Uh, obviously, really? he didn't take it. Yeah. Hmm. Didn't know that. Yeah. Antoine says programs like Minnesota try to build a high-flying offense, and that's hard to do, especially with NIL. You have to build a power team to have a chance because lower programs can't get high-end players. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, when you lose like 52 to 7 to another team, what can you do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true, but still. <laughs> Mm. Uh, this I think is true early to mid 2000s uh, Minnesota was decent they were pretty good when they had Barber and Maroney at running back says Rod Farva hmm. never heard of them yeah Minnesota used to be a good team mm-hmm. uh, at least a tougher team um, let's see Kevin Chavez says Minnesota can't recruit even at a middle tier level because it's Minnesota not nearly enough local talent not an attraction for national recruits NIL is dwarfed by the big boys and weather. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's absolutely true. When was the last time that you heard Minnesota land a big name recruit? You know? Yeah. I mean, currently Minnesota's Minnesota's 2024 recruiting class is 36. Their composite mm-hmm. is 36. Their transfer ranking is 59. Mm-hmm. And they don't have a single player. They have one Mm four-star, and he's from Muckwanago, Wisconsin, so he's used to snow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Tony, uh, and I'm sorry, Tony, I'm going to mess up your last name, so I'm not going to say it. Uh, Tony says that Minnesota was 11-2 in 2019. Yes, and that was P.J. Fleck's peak. He has not been back there, and with NIL the way it is, it's unlikely that he'll get back there, barring some... Massive upgrade. Well, I think it's, I mean, they have to figure out the NIL thing, but Minnesota does not have the resources to compete in NIL like the other teams do. Right. They just don't. I mean, there's, there's, you gotta, you gotta think about the economy of Minneapolis at this point. I I mean, Minneapolis has the mall of America, but what else do they have that is going to bring in the million dollar paychecks for players that are that that are going to Georgia or going to Alabama and and places like that. I mean, they're they're right. kids who are going to top tier teams, and the reason they're going there is because they're signing big contracts and and or getting those contracts because the schools are able to offer those types of things. And I for some reason, Minnesota's alumni base just doesn't have the money to pony up to be able to do stuff like that, provided I understand their NIL correctly. Well, yeah, that's what PJ Flex said. They they've the boosters have got to start investing more in the NIL or they're just, they're not going to keep anybody. Yeah. Yeah. Number 15. Whoops. Wait a minute. Whoops. Whoops. (laughs) (laughs) Number 14. Yeah. They're okay. They're 14. All right. Number 14, the UCLA Bruins ignore the graphic on your screen. (laughs) It's actually number 14. Hey, that rhymes. What to watch? New head coach, Deshaun Foster. Untried, untested head coach. This is his first time ever. Uh, new coordinator, Eric Bynami. 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 Mm-hmm. I apologize, Eric, for, for brutalizing your name. QB Ethan Garbers starts. Started six games in 23. On defense, four starters return, and they have a new coordinator. Oh, my goodness. Ikai... <laughs> Ika, oh, Ika Ika. Ika Ikaika, maybe? I think it's Ika Ika Ika. I apologize. I'm bad at these names. Uh, his last name is Malo. <laughs> we will call him Malo. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so UCLA is, is on some tough times, Mac. Now that they're in the Big Ten, what do you expect? I don't expect them to do very well. I mean, they're they're just simply not going to do very well, unfortunately. I mean, not this first year, maybe, maybe next year, but it honestly depends on how Deshaun Foster does. I mean, he was the running backs coach, you know, he doesn't have any head coaching experience like we talked about last week. So what, who knows where this is going to go for them? I don't believe that their recruiting class for 2024 was anything to write home about. It's literally ranked dead last in the big 10 right now. They have 10 commits, two of which are three stars. The rest are eight and less. Nope. Just eight. Nope. 
One. It's three. <laughs> did I just have a, a stroke and die or something? something they happened. have 10 commitments, two of which are four stars, eight of which are three stars. The rest don't exist because eight plus two equals 10. Okay? So there you go. I'm done. Move on. You're done. Everybody's still talking about Minnesota. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to step back. So Tony Tony says that it's a pro sports market in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. It's not a small college town. That's lots to do, that's lots to do and a lot of things to spend money on. Okay, that's fair. That's Okay. I didn't think about that. That's absolutely true. So where's the NIL money? Right. It's not going to happen. I Yeah, I yeah. yeah. Okay, actual number 13. The Northwestern Wildcats. Uh, this is, oh, David Braun's second year as head coach. And uh, he had some, I mean, it was it was fun to watch last year because he did so much better than, than uh, oh, was it Frost? No, Pat no. Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, what? I'm sorry. Frost was at <laughs> Nebraska, sorry. Nebraska. Fitzgerald, yeah, Fitzgerald. Uh, just, just phenomenally better. So on the offense, new coordinator, Zach Lujan. Zach Lujan. I should, man, I wish they had pronunciation keys for these names. And the defense, can they build on last year? So they're sitting at number 13. Mac, what do you think for this year? Don't know a lot about Northwestern. I just know that they don't have a great recruiting class. And that didn't really seem, the, the issues that happened with Pat Fitzgerald getting fired last year didn't really seem to matter, considering the fact that they've got to a bowl game. I think they even beat Wisconsin, didn't they? But in any case, I don't know how they're going to do this year. I don't know. Um, I don't have their schedule pulled up in front of me just right now. Um, but I don't expect it to be fantastic. But honestly, just based on what happened last year, I feel like they're going to do – I mean, they'll do better than Illinois, Purdue, and Indiana for sure, So and UCLA. So mm-hmm. there you go. Yeah, they actually went 4-0 and their last four games of the season last year. They beat Wisconsin, Purdue, Illinois, and Utah. Yeah. Oh, and I forgot about this, too. They're playing on a practice field this year because their stadium's getting renovated. Oh, really? Yeah. That's, oh, my goodness. Thank you for reminding me, Rod Barba. That's <laughs> true. That is, that is so funny. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, Connor Stallion says what Braun did last year was nothing short of a miracle. From one and eleven issues bling to seven and five and won a bowl game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was it was fantastic. They became sort of my uh I don't know, second favorite team, third favorite team, I don't know, just because it was just so much fun to watch Northwestern actually develop. I mean, I it wasn't a great season in the grand scheme of things, but for Northwestern it was a fantastic turnaround. Mm-hmm. And and David Braun is the reason for it. And I, I wonder how many how many people at Northwestern were kicking themselves for keeping Fitzgerald on for so long when he wasn't getting anywhere the last few years. Well, but he was getting them. I mean, he's gotten them multiple Big Ten championship game appearances. And that's just kind of crazy. Yeah. For North for Northwestern. Like what? Yeah. Uh, Kevin Chavez says Northwestern is 52nd in talent, talent composite. What? So mid-level in CFP. Yeah. Well, if you're 130 teams, 52. Oh, so, so yeah, just above actually mid-level. above mid-level. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Number 12. One of our favorites. What? <laughs> <laughs> The Michigan State Spartans. Spartion. What to watch on offense? New head coach, Jonathan Smith. Three starters return. QB, Aiden Childs is a uh, transfer in. Our uh, running back, Nate Carter, is a transfer in. On defense, whoop, I still have this up. On defense, uh, new DC, Joe Rossi. Eight starters return. Uh, 30 and nine, 30.9 points allowed per game in 23. So the Spartans had uh, probably, I don't know if it was one of their worst seasons last year, but it was definitely an awful season last year with the uh, uh, the scandal with uh, Tuck. Mm-hmm. 
and um and then now I'm forgetting his name. The guy who took over. Harlan. Oh, Harlan Barnett. Harlan right? Barnett, yeah. He, yeah. I, I think so. Uh, he took over and nice guy, uh, but just couldn't get it done. But the program was in so much upheaval. I don't know that he ever had a chance. I uh, was not even considered, I guess, for the head coaching position. So they brought in Jonathan Smith. So Mac, uh, I know you predicted fairly accurately last year that Michigan State was going to have a terrible season. What do you see for him this year? Uh, well, first off, Nate, Nate Carter was a transfer, but he, I think he he played last year, so he was already there. Oh, okay. Yeah, but in any case, um, yeah. So. I've got some notes here. Michigan State, I I actually would have put probably closer to 10, although I can't figure out who we've got ahead of them right now. Um, actually, probably 10 to 12 feels right. And I, I guess the reason is, is because there's, so there's a lot of really exciting stuff going around, going on at Michigan State. Um, and I say that kind of loosely, being a Michigan fan. but um, <laughs> From a pure objective point of view, I'm going to try anyway. There's some really exciting stuff going on with this with this coaching staff. So Jonathan Smith, really good head coach from Oregon State. That's really exciting for them. He's 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 a good coach. It feels like it's a really good culture fit for him. Um, the question is is whether or not he's going to be able to build in a way that is going to satisfy Spartan fans right off the bat. Spoiler alert: No. Sorry, it's it's not going to happen this year. But he's a good coach and and he can get he can start to get things rolling. The one thing I'll say that concerns uh, concerns me a little bit about it so far is that their overall ranking is 33 in the 2024 recruiting class. So that feels low from where I think they want to be, obviously, but maybe not a bad spot to start from. In any case, he did bring uh, his Oregon State quarterback with him, Aiden Childs. He, sh- he should be pretty good. That's going to be a pretty exciting thing for them. They do have uh, some talent coming back on defense. So they do have the eight starters coming back, which is good. The only crappy thing about that is that I think that they allowed, oh, yeah, so you've got 31 points against per game. So they're going to need some development, a little bit of help there. But maybe the new defensive coordinator can help out with that because I think aside from the Michigan game, Joe Rossi was the DC at Minnesota, and I feel like he actually didn't do too bad. So I, I think that there's some good stuff possibly coming there. They do have the 21st overall or the 21st ranked transfer class coming in. So this season's definitely going to be one where they're going to look for some transfer talent to try and maybe uh, kickstart some things going on. They did bring in, uh, they've got another Oregon State player coming in. Yeah, Jack Velling is a tight end from Oregon State, and he is a four-star. So they're going to have some some talent on uh, the offense um, for sure. And then they've got five transfers coming in on defense, four of which are actually in the secondary. So as I mentioned, they they allowed the 31 points per game in 23. A lot of that was through the air. I believe they had one of the nation's worst defenses in pass defense. So they're clearly hitting the portal to hit some of those secondary positions, which I think is a really good thing for Jonathan Smith to do. So I actually think that they could make a bowl game this season, but that's about it. So for me, I feel like it's probably a, a seven and five kind of a season for Michigan State. But that's that's good. That's that should be a really good starting point for them. And there's there's some really exciting things going on for them in the near future. I think. Max 77 says he thought Michigan State would be closer to the bottom dwellers. Uh, based on what happened last year, I think that's that's reasonable. But uh, I think they're they're put up at number 12 primarily because of Jonathan Smith. Yeah. Well, and because of the, the transfer talent that he's got coming in, I think. Mm-hmm. Little bro. <laughs> Little bro. <laughs> Can't call him uh, that. They don't like it. They don't like it. Although it is a term of endearment. I don't understand. Mm-hmm. Connor Stallion says in 2027, they'll be more competitive. I uh, got a damn good coach. He will need to rip this entire roster down and rebuild it. Yeah. And, and we're already seeing that happen because, uh, because of the transfer talent that he's bringing in. Um, it doesn't seem like he's really had a lot of success recruiting as much as he's really tried to hit the transfer portal to fill in holes for this season. 
So I guess the thing to watch is whether or not their 2025 class will be an improvement. Um, and so far, they don't have a single signee for the 2025 class, according to 247. Kevin Chavez says by his third year, the ball can get rolling for Michigan State. Yeah, I think yeah, that's, that's probably a, true. Yeah. Max77 also asks, how's their NIL money? No idea. Yeah, I have no idea either. Although I believe Michigan State has some serious donors. Um, they had the Spartan Dog for Life collective going on. I don't know yeah. how it ended. Um, and I, yeah. I, I'm not exactly sure, but it seems to me Michigan State has the same level of donors as Michigan or Ohio State. I don't know how, it, how like, how do you know? <laughs> I Just because I... While Michigan State doesn't often get, Michigan State seriously does get disrespected. Um, it's it's been kind of humorous from a Michigan fan standpoint over the years, but they do have a lot of, uh, because they are a nationally known school. They do have a lot of high end donors. Um, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, who knows? I I've been surprised at at Michigan has donors with hundreds of millions of dollars. So I mean, that's how they got the uh, the new press boxes built, and somebody donated yeah. two hundred million dollars from their estate. What? So, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. <laughs> Uh, Antoine says he's going to find out that it's going to be even harder to recruit at Michigan state. He should have stayed at Oregon state. At least he can collect the talented scraps from the area. Too many vultures here. It will depend on, cause I think Michigan state's really going to need to fight for the Michigan and Ohio recruits. Um, mm. but I don't know, maybe he can pull some of the West coast talent out over here, which would actually give him, I would think would actually give him sort of an advantage against some of those other West coast schools. Yeah. I don't know. It depends on where he's got his uh, recruiting pipeline. Right. I'm just going to leave that. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yep. (laughs) Uh, Michigan state has a brutal four game stretch with OSU, Oregon, Iowa, and Michigan. Yeah. Yep. Oregon Uh, and Michigan are both road games too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Rod Farva predicts six to eight wins for Sparty. I think I think seven and five is their ceiling. I would expect more yeah. of a five and seven, but I think seven and five is their ceiling. Yeah. Coming in at number eleven, the Maryland Terrapins. I uh, and uh this is uh Loxley's team. Loxley. Mike Loxley? Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. I, I said Loxley, and I immediately went to Robin Hood, and I went, no, that can't be right. Hang on. <laughs> Robin of Loxley. <laughs> what to watch on offense. Return solid foundation at skill spots. Five new starters. QB battle between NC State transfer MJ Morris, Billy Edwards, and Cameron Edge. On defense, three key players gone and a bunch of question marks. What do you think? Yeah, I mean... Talia Tugavailoa, for all of the mistakes, was a talented player. And he was one of those players that I I think he simultaneously kept you in games and also lost you games. (laughs) I mean, he, he would have plays where you were just like, oh my gosh, this kid is amazing. And then other plays where you're like, what was he thinking? Um, so it's it's really going to be curious to see what Maryland is like under Mike Loxley without Talia Tugavailoa at quarterback. Um, he's a good coach, but I think this is just another classic situation where the rest of the Big Ten kind of stacks up against him. Um, they're losing. They lost a couple of transfer, uh, a couple of players to the transfer portal. One of their best defensive players actually just transferred to Michigan. Uh, So they're losing some talent there. And then as far as quarterbacks go, I know MJ Morris is going to be an interesting name to watch. I don't think NC State really did that well last year. I don't necessarily know if it was his fault. I can't remember who started. Billy Edwards, though, 
I believe was the quarterback uh, who came in against Michigan in 2022. Uh, for the 2022 Michigan-Maryland game, Billy Edwards was that quarterback who, I, who came in for Talia because Talia wasn't playing too well. And I think Billy actually did pretty well. Um, he actually, I, I know they scored a touchdown late to bring Maryland back into the game at one point in the fourth quarter. So kind of made things, you know, kind of interesting. So I actually wonder if he's going to have the edge in this quarterback uh, quarterback battle because he's been there the longest. He knows the system um, and he's, you know, got a fair bit of talent. The problem is, is that I don't know that Maryland is going to, from from a full talent for, for a full roster perspective, be able to um, compete with the rest of the Big Ten, basically, because they're 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 a team that finds ways to lose games that they should win. Stepping back just a second, uh, Jason Bode asks: They get disrespected. This is about Michigan State. Uh, they get disrespected. That tunnel scene was all that I needed to see. Okay, that aside. Um, I have seen it where uh, Michigan State, I believe, was they they won the Big Ten championship or they were at the Big Ten championship. And then the picture on uh, Sports Illustrated was the, the headline was, you know, Michigan State Big Ten championship. And then the picture was Ohio State. Um, <laughs> not not a Michigan State player to be seen in that picture. I uh, also. Wow. D'Antonio was actually one of the first to talk about it, that when they did Big Ten Media Days, he was getting so sick and tired of the fact that it didn't matter how well Michigan State was doing or how much better they were doing than Michigan. Everybody wanted to talk to Jim Harbaugh or Brady Hoke or Rich Rod. They didn't want to talk to him. And he was doing better. Could it possibly be that Mark D'Antonio was a jerk, though? I Maybe it was, but but there is an argument for disrespect there. So I got to do that. I'm not, I don't know. I'm going to disagree because I, Mark D'Antonio, the stories that I've heard about him are, are that he is a cold, angry old man. (laughs) (laughs) Granted, I haven't heard a ton of stories about him, but like, there's this story where one of the first times that he came to, uh, he came to the big house to play against Michigan or to coach against Michigan with Michigan state, obviously. And Um, one of the Michigan, one of the big house employees who's supposed to welcome the opposing teams, um, you know, Mark D'Antonio steps off the bus and the Michigan employee says, you know, coach D'Antonio, I just want to welcome you to Michigan stadium. And D'Antonio looks at him and says, go to hell. And then walks away. I mean, that's in the, uh, the three and out book by John U. Bacon. Okay. So, and he's a reliable source. So Yeah. Yeah. I have absolutely no sympathy for Mark D'Antonio. I cannot stand him. Absolutely. Right. There, if there were a coach <laughs> that I had to say that I disliked the absolute most throughout all of history, Mark D'Antonio is that guy. I cannot stand him. He was a great coach. He did great things with three-star players. He's an incredible developer. He is an angry jerk of an old man. <laughs> Okay, let's throw this one. Kevin Java says D'Antonio was looking like Kevin Costner just got out of bed from three hours sleep. <laughs> yeah. All right, coming back to Maryland. Uh, Connor Stallion says Maryland has talent. Can they find a QB that won't turn the ball over every time he gets pressured? Exactly. I feel like yeah. Billy Edwards would be that quarterback, but it, we, it remains to be seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tulio, Tulio was the college football version of NFL. Jamie's. Jamie's Winston. Jameis Winston. Jameis Winston. Winston. Okay, five touchdowns, five picks a game. All right. (laughs) Yep, basically. Yeah. Uh, Maryland will be a high-end talent developer for Michigan. (laughs) (laughs) Jay Sean Barham. Yeah, yep. Jay Sean Barham was the player that transferred from Maryland to Michigan. So, yeah, yeah, he's right. Oh, Rod Favre says, remember, D'Antonio coached at OSU, too, as a DC. So he had Michigan hate before becoming the HC at Sparty. Well, that explains it. I, I feel like I knew that, but I, I did not remember that. All right. Hmm. Okay, moving up. Number 10, believe it or not, is Rutgers. This is one where I actually looked at it and I went, no, I've, I've got the wrong one here. No, it's true. Athlon has Rutgers at number 10 in Big Ten Power Rankings. Mm-hmm. Rutgers is not a terrible team, but they're not 
a great team either. So this one, I, I'll be interested to hear what you say. Watch What to watch on offense, return four starters up front. Gavin Wimsat or Minnesota transfer. Uh, oh, Kelly Manis under center. Uh, defense, 21.2 points allowed per game in 23. Eight starters returning. Mac, should they be at number 10? I think just from a talent standpoint, especially on defense, and then what Greg Schiano is able to do um, with, you know, just call it lesser talent. Yeah, I I think that this feels right. feels right to me. I, I think that they should, at, at the very least, be one ahead of Michigan State, um, wherever that ends up being. And, and I do think it should end up being middle of the pack. Uh, as far as the Big Ten is concerned. The only thing, so the four starters that return up front, that's all the offensive line, I believe. So they do bring back, I believe, basically their entire offensive line, which is huge. They bring back basically everyone on defense. That's huge. The questionable thing, though, is Gavin Wimsett, I don't know if, did he transfer out? Or? I don't know. In the Athlon article, it says, let's see here. Turn four stars up front. Uh, can the passing game I take a step forward with Gavin Wimsett or Minnesota transfer Kelly McManus under center? Yeah, yeah. He should be okay. there. He should be there. Okay. What I've heard is that Kelly McManus is actually an upgrade over Gavin Wimsett. But I don't know how that could be true given the way Kelly McManus played at Minnesota last season. <laughs> um, Kelly McManus threw two pick sixes against Michigan. Now, I get Michigan had basically the best defense that college football has ever seen but still (laughs) um now i mean cali uh whims that really couldn't move the ball at all against michigan but at least he didn't throw pick sixes um but that being said i i I guess it would just it remains to be seen how they're going to handle the quarterback situation but really if they have a good offensive line and a solid defense they really don't need anyone that special at quarterback. And I'm going to I'm gonna kind of say the same thing about Michigan when we get to them. They really don't need anything that special at quarterback um, to be a solid team. But that being said, I think that a solid team to Rutgers this season means somewhere in the neighborhood of, of probably six or seven wins. All right. Moving up to number nine, we have the incoming Washington Huskies. Brand new to the Big Ten with a brand new coach. And I just blanked on his name again. Jed Fish. Jed Fish. That's right. Jed Fish. Uh, and and this, again, was one I don't understand why they put him at number nine. I understand they're, they're coming off of uh, a spot in the national championship. But according to this, I mean, they've got a new head coach. They need a complete overhaul, zero starters returning. And on defense, they have major holes to fill. How do you put this team at number nine? Um, Because they're basically transferring in all of Arizona's roster, (laughs) which is, you know, threes and four stars. And, uh, and, and, you know, Arizona didn't exactly have the best season last year, but they did have a couple of victories that were, that were pretty great. Um, they're, they're bringing in the 10th rated transfer class uh, in the nation. I think that's why they're at number nine. Jed Fish is a good uh, good quarterback, a good coach too. So I, I, I actually think I like this. Just from a, a talent standpoint, I think that number nine is, is probably good. Um, what, what remains to be seen, though, is how they handle the first-year transition of a coach coming in, but then also the first-year transition of playing in a new conference. And the fact that literally their entire roster is gone. So, yeah, I, I, that's, that's what's questionable to me, is how they're going to be able to handle these, these transitions. But number nine feels good to me, just based on where their transfer class is. But I, I think that... Because of that, they'll have enough to pull off probably a bowl game, but I don't expect them to do better than, let's call it, eight wins. And I think that might be generous, um, but I don't believe that their schedule is particularly difficult. They have Oregon at the end of the season, but they start the season with Weber, Eastern Michigan, Washington State, which could be a tough game. Northwestern, we'll see. Rutgers, we'll see. 
Michigan's a loss. Iowa, we'll see. I, Indiana's a win. USC, you know, we'll see how their defense is. But I feel like Washington could pull off seven or eight wins. Connor Stallions says that uh, Jed Fish is a former Michigan assistant. And, and I just looked it up. And, yeah, sure enough, 2015 and 16, he was the uh, quarterback's coach, the wide receiver's coach, and whatever a PGC is. Yeah. I so, forgot about that. He's right. Yeah. <laughs> huh. uh, Kevin Chavez says that Washington is real tricky to, to rank with all of the transition. Yeah. Well, you were just pointing out. Um, yeah. Okay. Moving up, number eight, the Nebraska Cornhuskers. <clears throat> and yeah, my throat is starting to give out. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> we'll get through this. Uh, what to watch on offense? Five-star freshman Dylan Rayola at quarterback. And then on defense, 18.3 points allowed per game in 23 and eight starters return. So, Mac, do you think they're, uh, they should be at number eight? Uh, I actually think they should be a little bit higher. But we'll see. We'll oh, see really? where the rest of this list goes. I I feel like they should be higher than Wisconsin. So I haven't seen Wisconsin yet, which means that that Wisconsin is ranked. Wisconsin and Iowa are both power rated higher than Nebraska. And I would actually have Nebraska over Iowa and Wisconsin right now. And the reason is is because they do bring eight starters back on defense, which is great. Um, they're bringing in a pretty solid 2024 recruiting class so far. They've got some good transfers coming in. But the fact that they were able to to take, I mean, Dylan Raiola was committed, I think, to Georgia and then decommitted and committed to Nebraska. How do you do that? That's insane. Yeah, um, yeah I, so I would probably have put Nebraska, I mean, I would probably have put Nebraska at eight, but I would have had Wisconsin and uh, yeah, Wisconsin low and Iowa lower than them. So I'm kind of curious to see how that's going to shake out. But yeah, I mean, Nebraska's got Dylan Raiola coming in, who I believe has had a pretty good spring. Uh, Dante Dowell is a running back from Oregon who's transferring in. They're bringing in uh, some players from Syracuse. They've got one from Florida and Texas coming in. Um, so they'll they'll have quite a bit of talent coming in. So I'm honestly excited to see what uh, what Nebraska does this season. I think I think that they're going to be pretty good. Yeah, I, I forgot too. With Matt Rule at Nebraska, he he's the one who took uh, at Temple and Baylor. He took these teams that were not doing well and then advanced them into uh, near championship teams. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, in our our Nebraska video, the uh, freshman class video, we pointed out that he'll likely be bad the first year, better the second year. Um, and by year four, I think it was that he would be a championship level team and then leave for the SEC. I don't know how relevant that is now with all the landscape changes, but yeah, I, I guess I would expect Nebraska to do much better this year too. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm also seeing, uh, okay. So they offered him a lot of money. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, Matt Rule. Oh, yeah. He's like $70 million, I think. No, 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 no. Dylan Raiola. Oh, Dylan Raiola. Oh, okay. Yeah. They apparently offered him a lot of money, and Raiola has family that went to Nebraska. Okay. Well, that would do it. But, yeah. man, I, Nebraska was able to pay him more than Georgia? <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Nebraska got up more cash than Georgia for him. Yeah, yeah. apparently. That's crazy. But, I mean, the fact that his family went there would definitely help for sure. Right. All right. Moving up the ladder. Number seven, Wisconsin. So you were just wondering where they were. This is where they are. That's where they are. Uh, This is um, Luke Fickle's second season. Uh, on offense, what to watch for is the Miami transfer Q-back quarterback, Tyler Van Dyke. And on defense, they've got five starters returning. So is number seven a good spot? No, I think they should have been closer to 10 or 11. Um, I think Wisconsin is a team that's actually pretty balanced, but they're just not really all that 
good. Um, it feels like they've got talent. It feels like Luke Fickle is could be on to something. It just seems like there's not a lot of buzz going on with um, players that they're bringing in and talent that they're developing and stuff like that. I mean, obviously, this is only year two, so we'll give them some time. I'm not terribly excited about Tyler Van Dyke. Miami is Miami. You know, they're they're Miami. But I'm not entirely sure that he really adds enough to Wisconsin to make Wisconsin, like, much of a contender. Um, but that being said, Luke Fickle's a really smart coach. We'll see what he can do. But honestly, I think Wisconsin should be closer to like 10 or 11. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. Uh, taking a step back to Nebraska, uh, Jason Bode says, uh, Nebraska back in the day was a powerhouse. Yes, absolutely true. We actually cover that uh, in that Nebraska video that we have. Um, yeah. We should link that in the show notes somehow. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, some fantastic stats uh, back in the, I guess, 70s and 80s. Uh, they were, which is why they thought that when Nebraska came to the Big Ten that they were going to dominate, and they didn't. So, Well, they almost did. They had one good year. Their first season, I think, was actually good. Okay. Because didn't they go to the Big Ten championship game their first season? Or their second season? I don't remember. Uh, yeah, I don't remember that up. But it's All already right. 10 o'clock, so let's speed this along. <laughs> let's keep going. <laughs> I know, that whatever is in my throat is really starting to poke at me. Uh-oh. Uh, number six, the Iowa Hawkeyes. This one also kind of surprises me. Um, but I, nevertheless, here we are in Kirk Ferentz's 26th year. That is what surprises me the most. Wow. Uh, I was certain that he was going to retire this year, uh, but he did not. What to watch on offense? New OC, Tim Lester. We know Tim Lester. Yes, we do. <laughs> Former coach at Western Michigan. Who got fired. Uh, fired. <laughs> and now he's an OC at Iowa, I guess. Yeah. That makes sense. On defense, no glaring concerns, but a few holes to address. So, Mac, do you think number six is a good spot for Iowa? No, I think they should have been below Nebraska. <laughs> Probably number eight or nine. I don't know. Iowa is always going to have a really good defense, so I'm not going to knock them too much. It's just on offense, I have absolutely I, – I understand they're bringing in the new the new OC. Tim Lester might be good on offense. I really don't know because at Western, like, his offenses were good but really inconsistent. So that remains to be seen how they're going to do. They don't – I don't believe that they have a ton of talent on the offensive side of the ball either. I believe Eric All, um, the tight end, uh, declared – did Eric Hall declare for the transfer or declare for the draft? Oh, I don't know. Uh, possibly. Yeah, NFL draft 2024. Yep. So it looks like he declared for the draft. So they're losing Eric Hall. So, yeah, from a roster standpoint, I don't know who they have on offense. So I'm really not sure what to expect from them. So, yeah, I really would have put them down closer to like. Closer to 10, I guess, but I keep saying that for everybody. <laughs> I would have moved them down. Yep. Okay, I'm going to take a quick step back again uh, because Kevin Chavez says, I knew Nebraska wouldn't dominate the Big Ten, but yeah, Nebraska lost to Wisconsin in a Big Ten title game in 2012. Nebraska gave up 79.70 points. Oh, yeah. Uh, he corrects it in the next one, 70 points. 70 points, yeah. Yeah, I remember watching that game and thinking, wow, this is absolutely embarrassing for the Big Ten. And it was that was a nightmare game. Although I was kind of I honestly was kind of happy about it because I didn't like that. They said Nebraska was going to come in and roll. And then right. Wisconsin's just like, yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our top five. Number five, the USC Trojans. Brand new to the Big Ten. What to watch on offense. Need to retool and improve the offensive line. And they have a new coordinator on the defense. Uh, Danton Lynn. And this, again, is one of those, how, how can they be number five if they need to retool the offense and they've got a new D.C.? That just, I don't think you can start them out that high. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this is the Lincoln-Riley effect more than it is taking a holistic look at USC's team. Um, because Lincoln-Riley is obviously a very smart offensive mind. The fact is, is that his teams are often defensively challenged, though. 
<laughs> so I don't I don't entirely know what they need to do in terms of like the offensive line and stuff like that. I feel like they're pretty good on the O-line. They should be fine. Miller Moss is probably going to be the quarterback. He's going to be pretty good, it sounds like. The problem is, is that they're defensively challenged, although they are attempting to address those. So they do have the new defensive coordinator. Don't know a lot about him, but excited to see what he can do. They also brought in a linebacker coach from North Dakota State. He was actually the head coach at North Dakota State. And North Dakota State is, I believe, is it South Dakota State or North Dakota State that's always going to the championship game? Um, South Dakota State, I would. South Dakota State. I guess. think North Dakota State is actually pretty good too, if I remember correctly. But I, I think that it's it's more. Um, I think it's more that we just don't know what to expect from their defense because it needs to be better than last year. Last year they couldn't tackle anybody. They they are the reason why they the the USC defense is the reason why they lost to Notre Dame. They should not have lost that game. Um, they couldn't tackle. Lincoln Riley is only overrated as a head coach if he can't get a defense together. As a head coach, you have to understand what your strengths and weaknesses are. And to this point, Lincoln Riley has had really good offenses and really bad defenses. Now, if he brings in Dan Danton Lynn here and all of a sudden they've got a really good defense, then great. He's he's then they should be in national title contention. Um, provided the rest of their roster works out. Um, I feel like, wow. <laughs> so there's that so, <laughs> from Connor. <laughs> I feel like I'm done with my analysis and we can move on. <laughs> we can move on. Uh, Antoine says USC has a lot of resources. What they build their team like Ohio State from the outside in and they don't care about defense, but recently said they want to build like Michigan and you can Google it. <laughs> wow. I'm sure a lot of teams go. do given what Michigan accomplished last year. Yeah. I, uh, Kevin Chavez says that he agrees with USC at five. They have the talent, the D should improve and they have pieces on offense, new quarterback, uh, but he should be solid. Yeah. Miller Moss, apparently I, I didn't watch the bowl game, but I guess he had a really good game against Louisville um, because Caleb Williams opted out of that. Uh, to go paint his fingernails pink, and uh, yeah, so Miller Moss, I believe, is is a it had a really good game. So the future is is probably bright with him. The thing is, I I want to see if the offensive line can maintain, and then if their defense can get better. And if that's the case, then they should be pretty good. All right, moving on to number four, Penn State sits at number four. The Nittany Lions. What to watch on offense? How far can quarterback Drew Allard develop under new coordinator Andy Kotelnicki? On defense, every level of this unit has some turnover to navigate in 24 under new coordinator, <clears throat> former head coach of Indiana, Tom Allen. I want to say this is a recipe for disaster, but I'm just being cynical <laughs> tonight, so I'm sorry. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, yeah, they're going to be terrible. 0-12. Um yeah, they've got talent. Um, there's no question. Drew Allard is a really good quarterback. They we we understand that their running backs are really good. We know what they can do. Um, the thing is, is that they're restarting basically. They're starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. Two new coordinators. So it's it's a completely new offensive scheme. Um, they are bringing in some transfers that could be that could fill up some of their uh, some of their wide receiver issues. Julian Fleming actually transferred in from Ohio State. He's a good wide receiver, but he's battled some injury issues. Um, Penn State has also recruited pretty well on the offensive line, so that's good. The defense, on the other hand, loses Chop Robinson, and they do have some other really good names on defense, uh, but they I I don't believe that they really have a ton of depth that's going to replace the type of, of talent that Chop Robinson was. So they should still be pretty good, but I'm betting that they're probably going to take a little bit of a step back from where they were last year. Because at, at last year, at one point, they had the nation's number one run defense, if I'm not mistaken. The thing is, though, is that they're also bringing in a whole new defensive scheme with Tom Allen. That so was right up until they played Michigan. <laughs> yeah, until they played Michigan, and Michigan rattled off 31 straight runs. Yeah. So... This is kind of questionable to me. I, I feel like Penn State is in a really fragile position right now where 
theoretically they should be really good, but they've got some transition going on and they've got some turnover in the roster that, that if handled properly really shouldn't be an issue. But do we really trust James Franklin to handle things properly when, you know, during games, he really makes some questionable decisions? Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. LR is talented, just poorly coached. Yes, that is true. I, Kevin Chavez, on the other hand, I think LR takes a step up next season. It's possible. Yeah, he can. And he can, I mean, he can take a step up and still be poorly coached. Just because Alar gets better doesn't necessarily mean that James Franklin has gotten better as a coach himself. Mm -hmm. James Franklin knows how to lose games, and Oregon's coach is the same way. He's goofy and greedy when he doesn't need to, and he constantly loses big games because of it. This, That's true. You know, yeah. I think part of that goes to what we were talking about before, or at least what I was saying, <laughs> that I got frustrated when Harbaugh kept getting, when Michigan, I'm sorry, when Michigan kept getting ranked really high at the beginning of the season and, and Harbaugh being the, the media guy that he was, or the, the, the hype guy, that's it. The hype guy that he was, you know, would make yeah. us all feel like, oh yeah, Michigan's ranked way up in the top 10. They're going to do it this year. And then they'd fall apart. Um, and not do it. And what it really wasn't until, I mean, the 2016 season was pretty good, but then it really wasn't until 21 when Harbaugh shut up and things started to go. But I kept getting, I just wanted them to stop overranking Michigan. And I wonder now if Penn State, and as we said this before, I wonder now if Penn State is in the same situation where they keep getting ranked up near the top and they just can't pull it off. And is yeah, this uh, more of that frustration? Like the spotlight is too bright or something like that. Yeah. I just feel like every year James Franklin is retooling something, changing mm -hmm. something about the team so that they can take that next step. And then they never do. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, his record against OSU and Michigan is, is abysmal. Mm -hmm. Kevin Chavez says Penn state should be no lower than five. I mean, that's fine. Yeah, sure. I, I, from a talent standpoint, from from a coaching standpoint, like they've got good coaches, not great, but good coaches. Sure, that's fine. The problem is, is that we're not talking about whether or not they can beat Illinois or Indiana or, or, or teams like that. We're talking about can they take the next step and beat Ohio State? Can they beat Michigan? And they have the talent to do it. But James Franklin consistently coaches himself into a corner. Like I was saying the other day, he's a reactive coach. He doesn't really plan. He just kind of reacts. Mm -hmm. So Rod Favre is saying that Penn State should make the playoff. I actually meant to click on this one. I hit that one by accident. Penn State proved that team sacks is an overrated stat. They led the nation in sacks last year but didn't have any big wins. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it was Chop Robinson who had most of those sacks, too. Yeah. <clears throat> All right, here we go into the top three. At number three, Michigan Wolverines. As we know, Michigan has a new head coach in Sharon Moore. Uh, essentially a new staff, although a lot of the staff was uh, coached up from last year. Um, but uh, what Athlon Sports is saying is that they have a complete rebuild on offense, one starter returns, and then on defense, four starters return. And I guess I'm going to say the same thing I said with the other ones. If you've got to do that much work, how can you be number three? Even if you did win the national championship, it's not the same team. Because all of the second stringers and third stringers got playing time last year. So they, right. they were, they've been developing. They were extremely deep last year, and they're, they're pretty deep this year too. Not as deep. Like There are holes that need to be filled. The offensive line has the talent. They have the experience. They just need to be configured in the right way. So if Sharon Moore can, can use the offensive line, uh, what talent he's got there in the right way, the offensive line should be fine. The defensive line is going to be totally fine because, again, they're bringing back uh, Kenneth Grant, Derek Moore, Mason Graham. Those guys are monsters. They're going to be fine on the defensive line. They've got a little bit of depth there, not as much this year, so they'll need to develop um, as the year goes on, but they'll be fine. 
They've still got Ernest Hausman in the secondary. They've still got uh, Jay Sean Benny, the the Jay, Benny Barnum Bar- Barum, the guy from Maryland that we were just talking about. They've got him coming back to uh, Will Johnson is coming back. I was about to say Will Howard. Oh my gosh, Will Johnson is coming back as well. So right. Who's the other guy? Mike Sandra still was the guy who's gone. So Will Johnson's the one coming back. Mm-hmm. Um, so the defense, I believe, is going to be just fine. And then from a coaching perspective, defense, again, going to be just fine. From an offensive perspective, the, the wide receiver room needs a lot of help. They're going to need, so they've got Samaj Morgan. They've got some other players that, that are good. They just don't have enough of them. So they need to get some depth there. If one of the receivers goes down, Michigan is in a lot of trouble as far as the passing game is concerned. So Michigan, I really want them to hit the transfer portal tomorrow, and I want them to bring in one or two, maybe even three wide receivers, and and try and flesh that out a little bit more, add some depth there. Running back room is stacked. Uh, de- de- oh my gosh, why can't I remember names? Donovan <laughs> Edwards. Donovan Edwards is really good. Um Donovan Edwards is trying to to become more like uh, Blake Corum 2.0. His skill set isn't exactly there, but he is developing, and obviously we already know he's a really good running back. Kalel Mullings is kind of turning into uh, Hassan Haskins 2.0, so he's kind of that jackhammer that's going to smash right up through the middle on those short yard situations, which is fantastic. Really excited about that. And then Cole Cabana and Jordan Marshall, I believe, are both uh, really good. (laughs) I guess I got to let him have it oh at least my once. Gosh. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Stop pulling these up. They're distracting me. <laughs> Sorry. The biggest question mark, though, is quarterback. What is Michigan going to do at quarterback? Because if no one is really pulling ahead, then they might need to go to the transfer portal. That being said, if they can bring in some receivers who are pretty good and then maintain an offensive line that is pretty good, we already know the running backs are good. They could honestly just figure out they, – they only need someone to be as good as like Cade McNamara. And uh, and actually, I think that's something that Isaiah Hole said, that really you only need like a, a game manager at quarterback for Michigan. Michigan doesn't rely on dual-threat quarterbacks, so we don't need another J.J. McCarthy. We would love another J.J. McCarthy, but if we got another Cade McNamara, we'd be just as happy because we've got someone consistent and good who doesn't make mistakes, and that's fine. We're not trying to pretend that we can run the quarterback every which way because our running backs will do that anyway. We're the type of team that – Michigan is the type of team that you pretty much know what they're going to do, and you still can't really stop it, and that's from a player development point of view. That's If they can develop the players the right way, Michigan will be just fine. I think it's kind of a pipe dream to assume that Michigan's not going to take a step back from where they were in, in the last three years, but I still think that they have a shot at a, at a Big Ten championship this season. I think Antoine agrees with you on that one. Yeah, I'll tell you why, because all of our backups actually play and had great high-end roles in the game. Yes. that's uh, Yeah, that's an advantage to um, having the lead and going into the third quarter every game last season that the backups got to play. Uh, oh, so Antoine says Jeshwan, Jeshwan Barham. I think that's, that's who you're it. trying to yep. think of. Yeah. Oh, Jeff is having a day over there. Okay. Uh, Rod Farver says Michigan shouldn't skip a beat on defense, best interior defensive line in America and the best cornerback in America. Yeah, I agree with that. It's just offense. I think offense is the biggest question mark, but they've got the pieces. They just need to put them together correctly. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Max 77 says they have a brutal schedule. 500. They're not going 500. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Uh, The Georgia Tech game still makes me laugh. I think I might've missed something there. Yeah, Michigan doesn't play Georgia Tech. Yeah. Goodness gracious, we got a lot of stuff going on. Uh... <laughs> I'm sorry. I gotta... <laughs> oh, here we go. <clears throat> All RG has to do is get around 65%. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, I would like it somewhere near 70, but yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. Excellent. All right. Number two is the Oregon Ducks. Mm-hmm. What to watch on offense? Uh, not many glaring concerns. Oklahoma transfer QB Dylan Gabriel on defense, reloading the interior of the line and in the secondary top the list. Oh, I'm sorry. Reloading the interior line and the secondary top the list of offseason priorities. This one actually, this is almost a gut punch because you've got a brand new team coming into the Big Ten and they put them up at number two and it's like, ah. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. But yeah. what do you think? Does Oregon deserve to be at number two? Yeah, I I actually think that Oregon is going to win the Big Ten this year. Oh. And that, that really hurts to say. I I did a little bit of research on them earlier just so that I didn't sound completely stupid. And my question is that I want to see how Dylan Gabriel does at quarterback. And then I want to see um, how they do at reloading the interior line like you've got there. So those were the two notes that I had that they need to beef up their, their defensive line a little bit. But if they can do that, um, and Dylan Gabriel is a good culture fit and turns out to be the quarterback that they, they need, the next Bo Nix, if you will, um, then Oregon has a good shot at even winning a national championship, in my opinion. I think that they can win the Big Ten in year one. They're, they're, uh, they're what is this? Win, win, per, not win percentage, win prediction. What is that called? Yeah, I think that's right. You're, how many Do games win? are going to win? Yeah, it's uh, over under 10 and a half. I can't remember what that's called. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to wrap it up soon. In any case, yeah, so Dylan Gabriel was a 70, or had 70, uh, 70% completion record, a 30 to 6 touchdown interception uh, stat line, and then 12 rush TDs um, last season. So he was a dual threat quarterback, and he was pretty good at it, too. He took care of the ball really well. They've got off- both of their offensive tackles are back. Their interior O line has been addressed in the portal. Um, or at least it should be again because they have a history of going to the portal to support their offensive line. Uh, and then they also got a couple of corner uh, cornerbacks on defense um, from the portal as well. So, yeah, I think Oregon's going to be really good. I actually fully expect them to beat um, or to win the Big Ten. Uh, but that being said, I, I, I think that power ranking wise, they should be number one. Okay, well, a couple of uh, chats here. Tim Leineke uh, agrees Oregon is number one in his opinion. They have a QB. But switching over to Connor Stallions, he says Dan Lanning is one of the best at outcoaching himself. Yes. Yep. And that's that's the reason why if they don't win a natty, that's probably going to be the reason why. All right. Or if they don't win the Big Ten. <laughs> uh, all right. <clears throat> our number one team. Well, not our number one team. It's Athlon Sports' number one team. The team that doesn't get any respect. The team that is against (laughs) the world. (laughs) Number one is the Ohio State Buckeyes. What to watch on offense? Uh, The QB battle. They have not settled the QB battle, it sounds like, even after the spring game uh, Saturday. It sounds like there's still, at least they haven't announced uh, who their starter is going to be. But I think they don't usually do that until like the week before anyway. The week before yeah. the season starts. Yeah. The defense, uh, this unit should be among the best in college football with nine starters back in 24. So you kind of already answered this because you were saying that Oregon should be number one. So where do you think Ohio State should be? Number two. Number two? Yeah. I mean, yeah, They again, this is a team that's got all the pieces. Their defense is going to be incredible. I mean, let's – Let's not mince words here. The the defense lost some players. They 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 lost oh who what was his name? So they lost Tommy Eichenberg and Steel Chambers. And those are big losses for the defense. But they bring back Denzel Burke in the secondary. They've still got JT Tuomolo out, um, Jack Sawyer on the D-line. And then they brought in Caleb Downs, the Alabama transfer, and he's gonna uh, from the portal, he's a cornerback. So they're they're good on talent as far as the defense is concerned. For sure. And they'll be good on on process and schematic, too, because Jim Knowles has been getting better. Ohio State's defense, since Jim Knowles got there, has been getting better and better each season. Their running back room. Sorry. Oh, I see. Oh, I thought you were going to start talking. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> the running back room is 
absolutely stacked. Travion Henderson is still is still there, obviously. He's really good. I believe he had some injury issues that were kind of nagging. I don't think it's anything serious, but that's something to watch out for. And then Quinshot Judkins, there was a rumor that he was looking to transfer back to Ole Miss after Tony Alford left. I think that's probably crap um, from what I understand. I don't think that that's actually going to happen, and I would, I'm would i not going to speculate on that until it does, if it does. But in any case, for right now, I mean, he's an incredibly physical back. He's He's really, really good. So the only question then is that they need to figure out who's going to play quarterback. And you think think that they went to the portal to bring in Will Howard for him to be the starter. But now all of a sudden there's a battle going on between him and Devin Brown and Lincoln Kindholz, who I actually think is supposed to be transferring. He's, he's in, informed Ohio state that he's putting his name in the transfer portal tomorrow. Um, I believe that's the case. A uh, couple of other quarterbacks, Jaden something or another, and then Julian, something or another Julian saying who's I can't remember their names because it's 10 30 and I'm tired so <laughs> so in any case it's they just they have to figure out their offense I I I'm I would like to know what they're going to do on offense because I, I still don't understand why they're moving away from the Kyle McCord system to another system but then they bring in Kyle McCord 2.0 with Will Howard I mean Will Howard can run more than Kyle McCord can but let's not pretend he's like this massive dual threat quarterback that Dwayne Haskins or, or JT Barrett and, and JT Justin Fields were. Um, so I, I'd be curious to see how that works. There are rumors that Ohio state's culture is just not great, that it's kind of soft. CJ Stroud said that it was weird being at the Texans because it was actually fun to play there or something like that. I'm, I'm saying that way harsher than it actually was, but that was a thing that was said. I, from a talent standpoint, Ohio State should be number two in the power ratings, but I actually wouldn't be surprised if they lost two or three games. All right, looking at the chat here, we got a number of them. For some reason, Go Blue, Go Blue says, go Buckeyes. You I'm need not sure help. if he's being sarcastic or what, or if he forgot what his nickname was there. Um, Tim Leineke, who is getting some crap from some OSU fans for – I guess he does this. Says mm-hmm. they lose to Oregon and Michigan for sure. Maybe one in the playoffs, three games. I don't think that Michigan is for sure. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I I need Michigan to show me something good on offense before I say, like, yeah, they're going to go into Columbus and beat Ohio State's really good defense. Mm-hmm. Antoine says he wouldn't he wouldn't put Oregon in front of Ohio State. Hmm. I guess he's disagreeing with you. Disagreeing with you on that. Well, one. I I am because of the quarterback situation. <laughs> That's why. All right. Rod Farvis says Steel Chambers wasn't a big loss. He got benched toward the end of the year. Oh, all right. Well, he was a he was a contributor at one point for sure. Uh, yes. Buckeyes going back to power football this year. Run, run, run. That's we kind of talked about that earlier with uh, uh, Chip Kelly coming in yeah, and Alfred does going seem... out. but Yeah. Although uh, Alfred was the one who wanted to run more, but Chip Kelly also wants to run. So not quite sure what's going on there, but yeah, it looks like they might go back to the running game. Well, Chip Kelly, I think, is going to bring more of a 50-50 kind of situation. Oh, I think right. It'll be 50-50 pass run. Yeah. Yeah. Ohio State's defense should be no – should be number, number one, one, three at the worst. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Mm-hmm. Uh, open that transfer portal. This, yeah, that's going to be the interesting thing. I don't remember if I said that when we were just talking about Michigan. I think I might have skipped over it. But, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting tomorrow uh, to see if these teams have done what they wanted to do it in the spring practice because I, that's when we're going to find out how many players are going are gonna to check out and go on to other teams. Mm-hmm. Um. It's especially going to be indicative for Michigan, or it's going to be a strong indicator for Michigan, because if we we've been saying that it looks like Michigan should be reloading, but if we get a bunch of transfers out tomorrow, then we know that there's going to be a problem. Yeah, we'll we'll get some indication as as far as how cultures are going 
tomorrow. Right. <laughs> Rod Farver wants to assure us that the OSU culture is just fine. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Here we go. That's what I thought. Go blue, go blue. Sarcasm. Thank you. <laughs> Don't do that again. <laughs> um, Jason Bode says Kyle McCord transferring was a big mistake. I guess we'll find out this year if that was a big mistake or not. I, yeah. I have no doubt that uh, Ohio State will have somebody coming up that will be just as good or better. I don't understand why he thought he was going to lose the QB battle, though. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and I guess that's going to do it. And yeah, my throat's getting tighter and tighter there. I got something going on. I, it's up, I've got a wound in my throat. I don't know how, how or why, but it's there and it's killing me. (laughs) Oh no. Go to the doctor tomorrow. Well, get your uh, arrangements taken care of or your (laughs) hairs in order. (laughs) That's going to do it for us tonight, everybody. Thanks for the chats. Uh, uh, lots of stuff going on there. Really appreciate it. Love all you guys for subscribing. Uh, that's helping us out a lot. And um, like I said earlier, we are looking at, we're going to, uh, live, we're looking at going to, yeah. We're talking about live streaming Michigan's spring game this Saturday at noon. So if you guys want to be around, if you guys are around, uh, join us for that. And then again, our, our regular show Sunday night, next Sunday night. Yes. And I think that's going to do it. Anything, anything you want to add, Mac? We should talk about starting this show an hour earlier. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is hilarious. Okay. Uh, yes. Connor Stallions. I had hot tea in here until I drank all of it. <laughs> 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 and uh, Kevin Chavez. Yes. My wife keeps telling me gargle with some salt water. I'm going to go do that as soon as we get offline here. Uh, good advice. Thank you very much. Mac, take us out. This is medical advice (laughs) on the Big Ten Team Rivalry Show. Good night, everybody. Thanks. (laughs) Good night, everybody.